Uh, if we could please stand for a Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you. And again, good evening. Welcome to the August 15th Planning and Zoning Regular Board meeting. Uh, before we take roll call, I'd like to just introduce Nancy Austin, who will be our newest board member. So if I could have a uh, roll call from my left, please. Nancy Austin. Mike Dolan. John Grant. Anthony Sutton. Carl S. Moore. Rick Varone. Tom Panzella. Jim Quish. And I'm Board Chair Scott Marlowe, and we're joined by David Sulkis, City Planner, and Meg Green. Okay, first, uh, what I'd like to do, uh, before we even start, I'd like to uh, reorder the agenda, or ask for a motion to reorder the agenda. I'd like to do... Uh, items four and five under public hearing after number one and two. So what I'd like to do is new business, then public hearings one, two, four, and five, and then we would uh, discuss number three. Could I have a motion? Mr. Sutton. I move to reorder the agenda as such. I'll second. second. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, very good. We'll get started. We have a lot on the agenda tonight. Uh, first item of business is new business. Item C, 18-24 approval for an access easement agreement between the City of Milford and Eversource Energy on map 50, block 300, lot 3A, of which the City of Milford is the owner. Mr. Sulkis. Uh, yes, uh, this is um, uh, an agreement uh, to allow uh, Eversource uh, access uh, to some uh, land uh, that we own, uh, which is actually part of the sewer treatment plant, uh, so they can uh, gain access to and maintain uh, their uh, power uh, distribution lines that uh, run nearby. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the contract uh, has been approved by the city attorney's office, and just as a reminder, during the 8-24 process, um, uh, you are required uh, to approve uh, this as, as part of the process. Uh, and if you don't uh, approve it, uh, whether you approve it or not, it goes to the Board of Aldermen who make the uh, ultimate decision. If you approve it, it's a simple majority for the Board of Aldermen. If you uh, disapprove it, it's a uh, super majority for the Board of Aldermen. Thank you. Are there questions from board members? All right, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve. Mr. Panzel. Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Next item of business is a public hearing. 41 through 43 Hillside Ave, Zone R5, petition of Stacy Fior for a special permit and site plan review for a staircase on map 49, block 723, parcel 5, of which Hillside Commons Condominium is the owner. Is there anyone that's going to present that? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. If you could just state your name, address. Uh, Stacy Fiore, 4143 Hillside Avenue, Milford, Connecticut. Okay, so if you want to just walk us through it. Oh, okay. Basically, I just want to put access stairs in from my patio to my revetment wall. So I have stairs to get down to the water. Okay. Um, Mr. Solkis, any comments? Uh, Ms. Fiore should be commended for coming in and getting a permit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, basically, this is uh, as simple as it appears, uh, which is it's, uh, it's a concrete staircase that goes from uh, 
her uh, back uh, patio, which has a wall down to the revetment that actually goes across her property and many of the neighbors' properties as well. Uh, because it's within 25 feet of the mean high tide line, uh, that's uh, what brings her here this evening. Thank you. Are there questions from the board? All right, seeing none, thank you, thank Ms. Fiore. You. This is a public hearing, and we will open it up to public comment. First, I would invite anyone who is in favor of this to please come to the podium, state your name and address, and keep your comments to about three minutes. So anyone in favor? All right, seeing none, anyone that is opposed, uh, if again, you could come to the podium, state your name and address, and limit your comments to about three minutes. Anyone opposed? Okay. Seeing none, I would uh, ask if there's any further questions from the board. All right, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Barone? I am make a motion we approve. Uh, Mr. Chair? You, got yes. you need to close the public hearing. We'll close the public hearing portion. Okay, again, um, if there's uh, Mr. Brown. I uh, make a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Grant? Any question on the motion? Comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Anyone opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Fiore. Next item of business is item two under public hearings. 1680 Post Road Zone CDD-5 Petition of CFP Milford LLC for a special exception and site plan review for a boutique health club on map 109, block 804, uh, parcel 9, of which BLR Realty Company is the owner. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is John Nuff. I'm an attorney with an office at 147 Broad Street here in Milford, and I'm here tonight on behalf of CFP Milford LLC. I'll see if I can keep the, uh, the quick pace going. Um, just for the record, I have submitted the following record items. I, I, I have just submitted copies of photos of the uh, public hearing placard that were posted on both, both Boston Post Road and Woodruff Road on August 2nd. I have submitted one copy of, of a petition of support signed by 281 different people, and I have handed you a packet um, entitled City of Milford Planning and Zoning Board, Applications of CFP Milford LLC, and that has uh, five tabs consisting of our statement of use, um, our Orange Theory Fitness Overview. of. Uh, this is the same thing that was included in your packets, but uh, we provide another copy in case someone didn't bring theirs. Uh, a letter from our landlord at tab three. Um, shockingly, and I'd never, been, I'd never been part of this before, a letter at tab four from a competing landlord because of the wonderful things that Orange Theory has done for their centers. And then at tab five, there are um, letters of support or emails of support from other tenants in our center, which is uh, Milford Marketplace. And then as an adjunct, I also handed out uh, two late arriving emails from other tenants in uh, Milford Marketplace. So this is a special exception application for proposed Orange Theory Fitness Facility uh, at Milford Marketplace, which is located at 1650 Boston Post Road. And the space is approximately 4,000 square feet, and it's directly adjacent to Whole Foods. Uh, Milford Marketplace is located in the CDD5 zone. The center was first approved in February 2006. It was amended several times thereafter um, to add the bank. Uh, the site is currently overparked by two spaces. Um, as you know, a special exception application is for uses that are not specifically permitted nor prohibited in the zone. And it's sort of unusual that health clubs are not permitted in the CDD-5 zone because they are permitted in the CDD-1, 2, 3, 4, Shopping Center Design District, and even the MCDD. Indeed, in, in the CDD-1, 3, and 4 zones, they don't even need a special permit. Uh, while I was certain, uh, participating or observing the rate changes that occurred back in 2003, 
I have no recollection of why health clubs were excluded from the CDD5. My guess it was uh, simply an oversight. Uh, so even though shopping centers containing 40,000 square feet are permitted by special permit in the CDD5 zone, only retail, restaurant, and personal services are permitted and not health clubs. Health clubs are not uh, uh, deemed to be personal services under the Milford zoning regulations. So an applicant, when they're faced with a quandary of a use that's not permitted in their zone, is faced with two choices. Either you propose a regulation amendment or you submit a special exception application. And frankly, you know, I went back and forth, this, back and forth with this issue for some time with David and my clients uh, about which of the two paths we should go down. And we decided that even though a spe special exception requires a supermajority of seven votes, that the special exception route was preferred because of the unique characteristics of Orange Theory as compared to other health clubs. Now, I know that the word unique is overused, but it's entirely appropriate here, particularly as it applies to parking demand, which we know has been a concern for years in the city with regard to health clubs, and which are now required to have eight spaces per thousand square feet. So the question is, how is Orange Theory di different as compared to other health clubs? I would ask you to turn to tab two, and I'll just walk you through some of those pages. There's a number of sheets here. We're only going to talk about uh, three or four. So behind the, behind the title page, there is concept overview, and I've highlighted the, um, the portions I want to draw your attention to. Orange Theory is not a, what I quote, a loitering gym where members can come and go as they please for any length of time. All participants sign up for a specific class time in advance and can only join class if there is an available station. All classes are 60 minutes long, and individuals are not permitted to stay, nor are they allowed to enter the space on their own time when classes are not being held. The actual workout area, the studio, is less than 50% of the total space. In fact, about 1,900 square feet out of 4,000 square feet. On the next page, a little more of a description of the classes. Classes are divided into two groups. Um, 12 members at maximum uh, use one set of, um, of exercise machines. The other set of 12 use something different. Then after, after, after half an hour, they both switch. So therefore, the total maximum total capacity of the classes is 24 people. Uh, the national average of a class at Orange Theory is actually 19 members. So if you consider our space is 4,000 square feet, is parked at a retail standard of four, pa four spaces per thousand, there are 16 spaces allotted to our, prop to our space. Um, the center is overparked by two spaces, so that gets us to 18. The, on average, only, um, we are only one space short of the 19 visitors who would be coming uh, as part of the average class size. But as we'll see in a minute, most classes are held early in the morning before any of the retail stores are open or when the retail is at its most quiet. Um, and also, uh, one of the reasons why we have such um, uh, strong support from our lieutenants is because, because they all anticipate what we do is that those who are arriving, those customers who are arriving in the afternoon are also go going to go and um, visit some of the other uh, shops at uh, Milford Marketplace. So if you turn a couple more pages, you can see the, uh, the studio layout. Um, again, it shows that the, that the studio space itself is only 1,900 square feet. You notice that there are 12 treadmills, 12 rowing machines, and 12 benches. So you can't have any more than 24 people in this facility at any one time. Um, and again, the average class size is actually 19. And then perhaps maybe the most important thing is there's a parking survey uh, a couple pages later. Um, which shows that even during peak hours, there's more than sufficient parking available at the sites. Um, the classes are each an hour long. There is time in between the classes so that uh, the members of one class can get in their cars and leave uh, before the others arrive, so there's no um, so overlap of, of classes. And then even more importantly, if you look at the bottom of that sheet, again, the classes start at 5.30, <laughs> and go 5.30, 6.45, 8.15, 9.30. .30. So it wasn't not until you get to that 9.30 class that ends at 10.30 are any of the retail stores even open. Um, there's a class at noon and then nothing else again until 4.15. And you'll notice that on Saturday and Sunday afternoons there are no classes. So if, if we all you know, recall peak, uh, peak retail traffic times, which is always the Friday afternoon, the Saturday afternoon, the classes aren't being held during those times. Uh, they're being held before and they're being held uh, uh, after that time. 
So um, we're very confident that uh, there won't be a parking issue uh, with the center. And I just want to take you through some of the letters of support. Again, not reading all of them, but beh behind tab three, there's a letter of support from our, um, from our landlord. The second sentence says, the addition of Orange Theory to the shopping center will help Milford Marketplace uh, be a vibrant and, lo uh, and vital location for shopping, dining, and entertainment. We believe that Orange Theory's occupancy will produce new and valuable cross-shopping opportunities for the existing retailers at the shopping center. And then behind tab four is a letter from Bricksmore, which is actually a competing developer. The second paragraph says, Bricksmore has six Orange Theory fitness locations in its portfolio, and we enjoy the synergy Orange Theory has with other retailers in our centers. For example, when Orange Theory opened in our TJ Maxx Anchor Center in Carl Place in Long Island, uh, a yogurt place sales went up by 8%. Orange Theory attracts an, an affluent customer base of primarily female members who cross shop our grocery anchors, home decor retailers, and home goods, and more. In addition to bringing affluent female customers to our centers, Orange Theory schedule enables low demand for parking, and goes on to describe what I already just described in terms of when their classes occur. And then I would also just refer you to the, um, the letters of support from, um, from the other uh, retailers in the center, and certainly uh, while we all have concerns that there is sufficient parking on any site in the city, those, those people who have the greatest concern would be our landlord and um, our other tenants in that center. So, uh, be, but before we close, uh, Joe Miller, who's uh, a wonderful young guy who's got great um, dreams and passions for this, uh, who wants to bring his business to Milford, would just like to uh, speak to the board for a minute. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Joe Miller. Uh, my current address, which will be changing soon, is 75 Tresser Boulevard in Stamford, Connecticut. Um, I just want to begin by thanking you for the time this evening. I really do appreciate it. I've been in the fitness industry for a number of years with two of the most well-known luxury fitness brands in the world. Um, and I chose to open an Orange Theory or to try to open an Orange Theory Fitness because I recognized it as an industry-defining concept. I saw the model as extremely different from fitness, from traditional fitness centers, as, as John just described. It's something that's really needed in, in many communities across the country. And I I'd also did so because I've been personally impacted by this business. My mom is a longtime member, and I can say with confidence that this business has changed her life, not just her fitness, but who she calls her friends what she, what, and how she thinks of a community because it really does create micro communities within communities and that's very important to me. I also wanted to just stress how much I love this place, how much I really want to contribute to the town of Milford. Um, Orange Theory in the end is a premium brand with an affluent client um, and, and Milford's strong demographics uh, complement us well and are actually closely aligned with some of the best performing Orange Theories in the country. Um, my, my goal uh, is to keep is to be part of the fabric of this city to sponsor kids events to sponsor events in general to hire local employees to hire uh, to utilize local companies um, all that's very important to me taking a personal approach to, to what I do um, and having a positive impact on the broader committee as I've seen happen before um, so long story short with my experience in fitness, I've seen many times the, 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 the benefits of helping other retailers. It's something that I firmly believe in and, and believe that I can contribute to both co-tenants in our center and local businesses as well as the, the community mentors, and, and I'm dedicated to, do it, to doing so. so. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all we have, Mr. Chairman. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Sulkis, do you have any comments? I have nothing to add at this time. Thank you. Are there questions from the board? All right, seeing none, thank you. This is a public hearing, so again, I would invite anyone from the public that would like to speak in favor of this to first come, for, uh, to come forward, state your name and address, and keep your comments to about three minutes. Again, anyone in favor? All right, seeing none. Anyone that is opposed to this? Again, if you would state your name and address, come to the podium, state your name and address, and limit your comments to about three minutes. Anyone opposed? 
All right, seeing none, at this time we'll close the public hearing and I would entertain a motion from the board. Make a motion to approve as presented. I'll Is there a second? second? Mr. Grant. Is there any questions or comments on the motion? I have yes, a comment. Mr. Barone. Um, I'm in a similar demographic as far as physical fitness is concerned. Um, I've been a martial artist for 48 years. I've owned several schools. I think that your presentation is parallel uh, uh, as far as the uh, activity is. You have different activity, but everything that you have put forth, I think, is exactly the way it is as far as the number of people that come, the parking, um, the limited class schedule. Uh, I think this is going to be a great uh, uh, addition over there. So um, I think this is great. Are there other comments from the board? All right, seeing none, uh, there is a motion. All in favor? Is there anyone that's opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Next item is on our reordered agenda is item f under E, public hearing, uh, item four, proposed zoning regulation text changes. Uh, petition of Metro 150 LLC to amend the following language of sections 3.16.22 CDD-1 and 5.1.4 figure 4 amend section 3.16.2.2 to remove the requirements that multifamily residential buildings are only permitted in the CDD zone when at least 30 percent of the units are defined as affordable housing in accordance with section 8-30G of the Connecticut general statutes. Um, I'm going to go to the other ones too because well, actually, we'll do them. I, I guess we can do them one at a time. Now, the public hearing part of this has been closed, so there won't be any comment on this. As the board remembers, last time we voted on this, um, we voted, but uh, in order to do a regulation text change, we, need, we needed a majority being six members of the full board to, yes? Yeah, Mr. Salk. Seven, seven members. I thought they needed six members to vote one way. Six. Six. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so we, what we did is we voted uh, to, and it was a five to four vote, to not change the regulation. Um, we were told afterwards that that wasn't, uh, that wasn't a proper vote because we needed at least six people to act on a regulation change. So it's before us again for, for the board to act on this regulation change should we decide to do that. So um, Mr. Sulkis, can we discuss this amongst the board members or do we need a motion first? I think you need to, to make a motion and discuss the motion since the, the hearing is closed at this point. Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion on this, uh, on this item. Mr. Brown. I make a motion that uh, we accept it as it is stated. Is there a second on that? I'll, I'll second. I would that. second. Okay. So discussion-wise, uh, Mr. Grant. Uh, I'd just like to caution the board that uh, many of you know that there was uh, a regulation or uh, uh, change in the, for the statutes. It was overridden. Uh, the uh, governor's uh, veto was overridden. But I don't know if anybody understand, uh, knows at this point it's uh, actually going to court. Uh, also, there are some very major problems with the uh, regulations or the statute changes. Uh, one of the biggest ones is, is that uh, state statute states that properties have to be deeded. Uh, so even though the change says we can think, use things like the trailer park or whatever, those people will have to take and redeed all their properties. Um, plus, I have understand that it's going to be two to three years before this thing is all straightened out. Uh, we have other 830Gs that are coming down the pike. Uh, I know of three at this particular point in time. So I think. Any board member that votes for 
to change this regulation is going to be doing the city a very big disservice and especially to the to the city residences uh, because we're going to end up allowing more people to go into the single family areas and put in the 830 G's where we have this particular spot that has been zoned for 830 G and I really think we need to take and keep that as is and my suggestion would be to vote for the change not to approve it. Are there other questions, comments? Mr. Quish. Yeah, I'd like to echo um, Mr. Grant. Um, I think that uh, a past board decided that they wanted to allow residential in this zone only if it's an 830G. So it was kind of a plan that they made. Um, the way the, the statute reads is that in order to change uh, a zone, you need to have six members voting in favor. We did not do that last time. We voted not to change. And it's my position that the vote that we took at the previous meeting is a legitimate vote. And um, so I see this process as problematic personally. But I would advocate f to the board that we hold to what uh, the previous board had designed this particular uh, zone to accept the 830G. And again, it is really life-changing for people in these neighborhoods that have, um, you know, 12 or 15 units put where a single family house was. And um, I think it's our responsibility to stand up for those people as well as we can. One way we can do that is right here, right now, tonight, and make sure that this land that has been earmarked for um, an 830G development hold true to that previous board's wishes and in the best interest of the city um, and the, the rest of the, you know, the uh, people who live here. Um, so I, I would advocate that my fellow board members um, vote against this change. Other comments? Mr. Moore. Yeah, I would like to disagree with um, both Mr. Grant, commissioners, and Mr. Quish in regards to this um, motion. I believe that any developer who would like to develop in this particular CDD1 zone should be able to develop. And I believe the language in the text is, how I like to say, borderline segregation. If uh, someone wants to come into a zone and wants to build something better than an 830G, they should be able to do so. And I believe this segregation, no matter how unintentional or intentional it may be, I believe it's on that borderline or on that cusp. So I'm more than likely going to vote for this. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. Brown. The last time that we uh, discussed this, I voted uh, for the change. I still believe that this should be uh, changed and allow this to go forward. I feel that our board has been held hostage by the state and we have uh, three representatives that have been working tirelessly to try and lift some of the burden of the 830G regulations from having no choice. Uh, the last meeting we had we voted yes to an 830G project which was inappropriate and abusive to the neighborhood. Um, but we almost, we had no choice because we're, our hands are tied. They take us to court, we lose the court, we look like fools, and we have an opportunity now to be able to do something positive for Melford. This is a great project. Um, it doesn't have to be 830G. Uh, it can be as it is proposed, and I think it'll bring great prosperity uh, uh, to the area in Milford. It's an area that needs to be developed. It's a great way to develop it. And uh, personally speaking, I'm tired of the state holding us hostage all the time. They sit up in Hartford and they don't live in Milford. And I think it's time for Milford to stand up and say, wait a minute, there, this is maybe not appropriate for an 830G project. Maybe it should stay the way it's been proposed. So I'm going to stand the way I voted the last time, and my comments have remained the same. I think this project is good for Milford as it stands. I think it should be approved. Are there other comments? I, um, yes. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Sokis, at the last meeting, I asked you when this regulation was enacted by the board. Was it 2004? That is when the CDD zones were created, effective January 1st, 2004. And that's when that requirement of 30% for a residential component of a development within that district was put in the regulation? That is my understanding. And again, just, just to reconfirm, since that time, have there been any residential developments built in the CDD1 zone? There have been no residential 830G developments built in any zone where we would like them to be built. They have been built elsewhere. Also, keep in mind, if you do change this regulation, that doesn't preclude 830G from going into that zone, because remember, 830G can go in any zone that's not industrial. So even if you remove the requirement to allow market rate, at some point down the road, you, someone in theory could come in with an 830G, although it has not happened in any of the CDD zones yet. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may continue. Yes. I would like to speak in favor uh, of changing the regulation. As uh, Mr. Sulk has said, we've had this uh, opportunity, this regulation been on our books for uh, 13 years, and uh, it hasn't uh, had the effect which I'm sure it was intended to have. Uh, what it does, or what it appears to do, is to discourage development, development of the type uh, that is presented tonight, and uh, development that would add a vibrancy uh, to areas where it ordinarily may not, uh, may not occur. I think it's a much more reasonable thing to address 830G uh, with our regulations or even uh, by ordinance, uh, not to punish or discourage developers, but to encourage that. And I think the way that the regulation is currently formulated, um, it doesn't encourage it. Uh, it really acts as a deterrent. So uh, I wish to uh, join um, Mr. Moore and Mr. Verone in support of the change. Other comments? Mr. Grant. Uh, just a reminder to the board that when you approve any project, that is not an 830G, you're adding more apartments to our housing stock, which would require for us to gain even more points, allowing for even more time for more developers to come in and put 830Gs in areas where we all feel that they're not appropriate so by if you approve this to be a not 30 to allow it without a 30g uh, approval you are opening up the city to a longer period of time to be bombarded with 830gs thank you are there other comments mr brown uh, this issue with the 830g uh, has been going on for years this project, whether we approve 830G or not, will not change that. It will continue to go on. Uh, there isn't enough units here to make much of a difference uh, at all in the numbers. We're so far away from making those numbers that uh, I, I, don't, I don't see that that should be a consideration at this point for this particular project. Thank you. Um, yes, Mr. Panzella. I agree with Mr. Sutton, Mr. Bourne, Mr. Verone, that this is a good project. This should go forward. This is a project that, that will only enhance the city, and I think it should go forward, and I'll be voting for it. All right. Thank you. Um, other comments? Ms. Wilson? No. Cool. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, for the record, I have reviewed all the recordings um, of meetings prior regarding this matter, um, so I do feel that I'm informed enough to make a vote. Thank you. Uh, I would like to make a comment or two. Um, first, in a general standpoint, uh, with any regulation change, I would just ask the board to make sure that we think through what we're, what we're changing. I mean, these, these regulation changes are far-reaching, and uh, our authority comes from the regulations. 
So I want to make sure that no matter which way we vote, that we're thinking through any regulation change, not just this one in particular. Um, my personal opinion or my thoughts on this is I would uh, echo what Mr. Grant and what Mr. Quish have said, is that while I'm not questioning the project being a nice project, bringing, um, you know, bringing some vibrancy to that area, I just feel that we're putting a burden on future development here because we're adding to the stock of the apartments. And sooner or later, we still have to meet these, um, the, the requirements of 8-30G, whether we like it or not. That's the reality of what we have to do. And it just seems to me that we're now forcing people to look to these smaller residential areas where we have just said we don't want them, they're not appropriate. But yet we're saying you don't have to do something in this one location. So uh, again, I'm not questioning that it's a nice development, that the, it will be built well. I'm not questioning any of that. I'm just questioning the, or going to not vote in favor of this because I just feel it's, it's adding to the stock, it's adding to the amount of apartments that we have to put sooner or later somewhere. So that's my comments. Are there other comments? All right, uh, seeing none, there is a motion on the floor. Um, if we could just repeat the motion. Meg, could you just repeat what the motion is so we're sure? I don't have it um, verbatim. Uh, Mr. Verone, uh, motion to, to approve. Approve the, the text regulation change. change. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. For clarification, is that um, the entire uh, text regulation change, amendments uh, 316.2.2, as well as 316.2.24B, and 5.4, figure 4? We had only discussed the one, but if Mr. Brown would like to amend his motion to include those other two, we can handle it that way. So, Mr. Brown? I would amend the mo a motion. I would amend the motion to include the other two items. Mr. Solkis, do we have to rescind the first one and then make a new motion, or can we just amend it? You can vote on the amendment, or you can ask him to rescind it and make a new amendment. Well, uh, we'll, we'll vote on the amendment. Uh, so there is an amendment to this. Uh, is there a second? Second. Mr. Sutton, uh, all in favor of the amendment? OK. Um, all opposed? Mr. Quish? Mr. Grant? OK. So uh, the amendment passes. Now we will vote on the text regulation change itself, which is including uh, the three items. So all in favor of that text regulation change? Can we have a voice vote? Uh, we've been asked for a voice vote. Well, this is just, if it's, it, Mr. Quish and Mr. Grant are voting, are not voting just, in favor. I'm not do, voting. Do, do, do a, please, just go down the, and yes. ask each board member yes. a by voice vote if Ms. they are Austin. for uh, the motion or against the motion. For the motion. Mr. Dolan. For the motion. Mr. Grant. Against the motion. Mr. Sutton. For the motion. Mr. Moore. For the motion. Mr. Barone. For the motion. Mr. Panzella. For the motion. Mr. Quish. Uh, against the motion. And I am as well against the motion. So we have 623, I believe. So the motion passes. So the text regulation, yes, Mr. Quish. I, I, I think our uh, regulations call for a seven vote majority to, to change a regulation. We have a legal opinion from the city attorney that says it doesn't matter what our book says, it's what the state statute requires. And the state statute says that it's uh, six. And there's also a Supreme Court case that bears that out as well. All right. So the motion has passed. Um, we will now move on to item five. Uh, 50, uh, 92 Plains Road, 100 Plains Road, 150 Boston Post Road, and M53 B304 L88 
A zone CDD-1 uh, petition of Metro 150 LLC for special permit and site plan review approval to construct multifamily residential at map 43, block 304, lot 80, and map 53, uh, block 304, lots 82, 83, and 88, of which Jordan Realty LLC is the owner. I know. I'm, I'm... Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, John uh, 147 Broad Street. Uh, attorney for one, a Metro 150 LLC. Uh, this is a, a continuation of the special permit application for a 168-unit multifamily community consisting of 12 efficiency units, 104 one-bedroom units, 52 two-bedroom units. Those units will be in nine separate buildings together with a clubhouse that include a gym, game room, and meeting room. Uh, as we said, the proposed community will feature the same high-level design, architecture, and finishes found in other Metro Star communities in Milford. Um, and as we know, um, our three requested regulation amendments uh, were just approved minutes ago. And if I can editorialize for just a bit, um, I do appreciate all the thoughts both for and against the regulation amendment. Frankly, I sympathize with the position that you're in. Um, you're, you're faced with the problem of nearly every night that you volunteer your time to come here, and you're faced with another group of neighbors who are opposed to another 830G application. And I know that you're in between a rock and a hard place, and uh, so we appreciate and we understand the difficult circumstances that this statute has put you in. Um, I would ask you to keep an open mind that in terms of this actual application. Um, I don't think you would ever see 168 units uh, 830G application. There are either going to be a 12 unit application because you don't have to comply with a lot of the requirements of the building code for a larger building like sprinklers and uh, handicap accessibility and elevators. Otherwise, you're going to get a 400 or 355 unit multifamily. So you would never see an 830G application with 168 units. It just makes no sense. And it also doesn't make any sense in this zone. Uh, and that's why you've never seen one before. So, um, Again, I appreciate uh, all the thoughts, pro and con. Um, I'm sympathetic to the plight that you put in. We have our full team here. If you have any questions, if you want to revisit any of the issues, uh, I think you know that we received positive feedback from every staff member on this application as well as all of our other applications. So if you'd like to hear from any of us or if you have any specific questions regarding the special permit and site plant portion of the applications, we'd be happy to address them. Thank you. Mr. Sulkis. Any thoughts? I mean, um, we, I know we went through this at the, you know, a couple, I don't know, two months ago, a month ago, whatever it was. Um, and I know that there was a question about uh, the buses, and I don't know if you've had a chance to talk with the Board of Ed about that. Uh, Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ray Macaluso. I'm the owner of Westcott Mapes Consulting Engineers, located at 142 Temple Street in New Haven. And I did have a chance to talk to uh, uh, Mr. Rich Telly of the Board of Ed, and he prepared a letter stating that he was not in favor of having any bus access on the property uh, as a reason throughout the whole city. We do have a letter to that effect. Uh, Attorney Nuff has that letter, but uh, he was not in favor of any access directly on the property itself. So we, uh, we did have a conversation, and he was uh, thoroughly against it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sulkis, maybe you could just weigh in on this. Um, at the last meeting, or when we discussed this last, my understanding was is that we were pretty much limited to just going to discuss the idea of the bus. Is that correct? My recollection is when we ended that evening, the, the hearing was held open to get the answer to that particular issue. So I suppose if uh, there's any members of the public who want to speak on that particular issue, um, you know, they should be able to do so. Thank you. Are there questions from the board first? Or I'm sorry, attorney, are you, do you have more? Uh, nothing else, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Are there questions from the board on this? Mr. Barone. 
Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought we had discussed this um, at one of the, la the last meeting, and Mr. Smith decided that he would put some kind of a turnaround at the entry for a bus to be able to come in. Uh, somehow, I, I, I may be... I think, Mr. Brown, I think the, Mr. Smith had offered that he would do that yeah. if, if we were going to check. Was, yeah, if, if the, the Board, board of Ed, Ed was comfortable with it, I would have And it. And they, so then, is, then Mr. Riccitelli is saying that he is not he, he in does, support of that. Right. He doesn't want the bus on private property. Okay. Right. Yeah, the, the reason, uh, Mr. Chair, the, the reason is the Board of Ed and the bus companies, they deliberately want to be able to stop in the street, not off to the side, because they have the flashing lights and they, they want to stop the traffic. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Panzel. What do we do with other uh, apartment complexes like Avalon and stuff like that with uh, access to buses? My understanding is they're picked up on uh, Woodmont Road. The buses do not go in. Mr. Grant. Uh, at the last meeting, I had made the suggestion and it was accepted. I, I don't see it on the board. I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember the street that's on the upper left-hand corner of the property. You were gonna put in an emergency exit, a gate, mm -hmm. so that basically there was another way to get out of that complex if the main roads are there and would also gain access yep. for the fire department. Yeah, I'd be happy to have that as a condition, Mr. Grant. Other questions from the board? Okay, thank you. Seeing none, um, this public hearing is still open to address the item of the, the bus stop, drop off, whatever we want to call it. So if, um, again, if anyone wants to speak in favor, um, I guess in favor of that, how to word this, um, there, there was the proposal of putting in a, a drop off area off Plains Road. In, um, in talking with the Board of Ed, they, have, they would not want that done. They don't recommend it. They don't want their buses on private property. So. I guess in favor, um, would be in favor of leaving it as it is. <laughs> or you can just ask for public comment on, on it and don't, don't worry whether it's pro or con in this particular case. All right. That makes it easier. Um, so I would invite anyone from the public that would like to speak on specifically this issue of the bus drop-off um, and again whether it's pro or con if you could come to the podium state your name and address and limit your comments to about three minutes all right seeing none um, at this time unless there's further questions from the board I would uh, close the public hearing any other questions? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. And I would entertain a motion uh, on, on this item. Mr. I make a motion that we accept it. Is there a second? Comments? Yes, Mr. Dolan. I'd like to see the motion amended to include the emergency exit. I, I can't, I'm sorry, what's the name of that street? Is that Virginia Street or something? I, I'm sorry? Yeah. Mr. Verone, would you amend your motion? Uh, I'd like to add an amendment that um, the access for the bus pickup would be on... No, we're, we're looking for an emergency exit out of the back of this development. Oh, okay. Basically. That... We're just adding an emergency or a second means of access. Uh, all right, let me try that again. So I will add an amendment that we approve an emergency exit access on the junior street side. Uh, okay, is uh, there a second on that amendment? Okay, so first we'll vote on the amendment. Um, so I would, uh, is there any questions on this amendment? All right, seeing none, all in favor of the amendment. Anyone opposed? Mr. Quishes. All right, the amendment passes. So now we're back to the motion. Uh, is everyone 
the, the motion is to approve the project with the amendment of having an emergency or second means of, agri of access uh, onto Junior Street. So that is the, the uh, motion that's there. Is there any questions on that? Just to clarify, Mr. Yep. Mr. Chair, that would be an emergency access. It wouldn't yep. be a, 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 a secondary uh, used uh, you know, daily uh, entry yep. or exit. It's just for emergency purposes. Absolutely. Any questions on the motion? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you. All right, next, um, next item is 353, uh, 553 West Avenue. And I am going to recuse myself. I'm a member of Kingdom Life Church, and um, I don't want the perception to be there that I'm voting one way or the other. So Mr. Sutton will be acting chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is item three under public hearings under section D. This is 553 West Avenue, the petition of Grillo Services LLC for a special permit and site plan review for residential development pursuant to Connecticut General Statute section 8-30G on map 42, block 335, parcel one, of which Kingdom Life Church LLC is the owner. Good evening, Mr. Lynch. Good evening, Mr. Acting Chairman and members of the board. Just for the record, my name is Thomas Lynch. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Lynch, Trimbicki, and Boynton, and my office is located here in Milford at 63 Cherry Street. And I'm here tonight with my clients, Michael and LJ Grillo. Michael and LJ are the principals of Grillo Services, LLC. Their company is the contract purchaser of the property located at 553 West Avenue. And we're before you tonight at the end of a rather long journey that it's taken approximately a year and a half going through other administrative approvals uh, necessary to bring applications to you tonight for approval of a site plan and also a special permit pursuant to the provisions of Connecticut General Statute 8-30G for the construction of a 342 unit residential multifamily development on this site. Now, as I said, we've been working on this for over a year and a half, and I have to be honest with you, I've had the pleasure during that year and a half of working with some gentlemen that are the most professional and uh, gifted and talented men that I've worked with on projects, and I've been doing this for 37 years. And with me tonight, I have Fred Mesha, who's uh, a principal of Tie and Bond Engineering Firm in Shelton. Fred has put together the site plan that he's going to be presenting to you tonight. It's a uh, well-engineered plan. Uh, it received extensive scrutiny from the Inland Wetlands Agency through two series of public hearings to receive a final approval, which we did receive uh, earlier this year for the development. So Fred will be uh, going through the uh, logistics of the site plan. Also with us tonight is Eris Stallis. Uh, Eris is the principal of Eris Land Studio. He's the landscape architect who's worked on this project, and he's going to go through the physical features of the layout of the buildings and the way that they were designed to enhance uh, basically the utilization of the open space and the beauty of this particular piece of property. Also with me is Tim Gooding. Tim is the principal of Gooding Architecture in Stanford. Anybody who has driven down Interstate 95 through Norwalk, Darien, Stanford, or Greenwich have seen a variety of developments that Tim has uh, uh, put together over the past 10 to 15 years, and these buildings will speak for themselves. They're beautiful, they're well designed, and he's going to go through the layout of the buildings, the elevations, the floor plans, and 
most specifically address some of the comments that were made uh, in a memo that was issued by uh, Joe Griffith, our Director of Permitting and Land Use, which we just received yesterday. And um, uh, Tim, in fact, is going to address some of those uh, issues that were raised in uh, Joe's memo. And if there's any supplemental information that we need to get to you, I'm going to, at the end of tonight's presentation, ask that this uh, public hearing be uh, left open. And then lastly, Robert Jerzin. Robert is a former member of the Wethersfield Planning and Zoning Board. I believe at one point he was the uh, chairman of that commission. Uh, Bob is a traffic engineer. He put together a extensive traffic analysis of the traffic flowing from uh, this development. It was uh, put together in a rather extensive report which you should have received back in March when uh, uh, the report was drafted dropped off in the zoning office, and he's going to address the traffic issues and the traffic concerns uh, that you may have <clears throat> as a result of this project. So let's go back and look at a little of the background of this property. The property is located in the DO zone, DO 25 zone, it consists of some 57 acres. The property is owned by the Kingdom Life Christian Church. It was purchased by the church in 2001. And of the 57 acres, uh, more than 40 of the acres are encumbered by a conservation easement in favor of the city of Milford. If you've been on the property, you know that there's walking trails throughout the property. Uh, there was a boardwalk that was <clears throat> built some time ago. Uh, so that portion of the property, some 40 acres, will remain in the current state as it is because it is encumbered by this conservation easement and cannot be developed. There's roughly 10 acres of the property open for development out of the 57 acres. The site plan as we have here presented to you uh, consists of two residential buildings that will be constructed. As I said at the outset, there will be a total of 342 residential units in those two buildings. They are split into uh, the various uh, configurations of one, two, and there are in fact some three bedroom units um, within the buildings. And there's going to be two parking garages attached to each of the buildings. So out of the uh, 342 units, there will be 522 parking spaces on site to accommodate uh, cars either uh, of the residents or for uh, visitors coming onto the property. I believe you all know where the property is situated. It's between Interstate 95 and the Metro North um, uh, tracks. Uh, and uh, again, the basic demographic feature that we like to stress in presenting this to you tonight is the uh, fact that nearly 80% of the property will remain open space uh, and not subject to development. We like to refer to this project as a luxury high-end development, and that's what it is. It has an affordable component under the terms of Section 830G of our statutes, but again, and I'll go through the affordability plan with you shortly, and as I have with other projects that I've presented to you, we all know that based upon uh, the per capita income and the 60% and 80% ratio of uh, division of the more than 100 units that would be uh, subject to tenants meeting those income standards, based upon Milford's per capita income, we're talking about tenants who have incomes of 50 to $60,000 a year. These are teachers, these are firemen, these are policemen, these are young professionals that come out of school, they get their first jobs at Sikorsky or they want to get on a train and go down to work in Stanford, Norwalk or even New York City and they want to be able to live in Milford and this provides a component of this project to allow individuals such as that to live in Milford. I, in terms of going through all this, uh, we had a meeting in my office uh, a couple weeks ago and the term signature property came up and we were all brainstorming and talking about um, each town as you drive either through uh, 95 or if you take the train down to New York City, think as you go through each town, uh, highlights. You go through Bridgeport and you see the People's Bank building or the Webster Arena or you go through Stanford and you see the Avalon properties or the other uh, developments that have uh, developed on, on the harbor side of Interstate 95. 
And we would like to present to you that this would become one of Milford's signature properties. And the irony of it is that three years ago, most of you were on the board. My clients came before you with an application for a site plan review and a special permit to allow the relocation of their composting building, uh, composting facility on Oran Oak Road to come to this property. And there was a great deal of public outcry about that. There was a great deal of uh, 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 comment from neighbors, some many of whom I believe are seated, seated behind me tonight, uh, that were complaining about truck, tr truck traffic. They were complaining about dirt, dust. And when I talk about a signature property, I'm going to refer to the buildings that Tim's going to go through with you in just a minute, and you're going to see the pictures of those buildings. And I think the irony of all of this is that you denied that application. You didn't allow my clients to relocate their business onto this property. And in going through Milford on a train or driving on Interstate 95, if you see fit to approve this application, now instead of seeing compost piles, on this beautiful piece of property, you're going to be seeing these buildings. And I think that that's something that really consider during your consideration of our <clears throat> application. The property is located in the DO25 zone. And I gave to Meg a handout. I'm sure that all of you have that, if it's been passed out. OK. I'll take a minute just for. It to make its way. In the handout that I gave uh, at the outset, I have a number of exhibits and I'm going to go through most of them. Uh, but what I'd like you to do is turn to tab number two. And Bob Jurzen put together a uh, traffic summary that compares the traffic that would be emanating from this property through ingress and egress and comparing it to permitted uses in the DO25 zone. And if you're familiar with the zone regulations, you can have offices in that zone. You can have data centers in that zone. In that zone. By special permit, you can have uh, hotels that exceed 100 rooms. And what Bob did, I asked him to put this together and he printed this out, using the data in his traffic analysis. What he did was he put together proposed uh, traffic, first of all, based on a 300,000 square foot office space construction that would be allowed on this property. And the total weekday traffic generated by a 300,000 square foot office space would be 3,309 trips onto the site. The next item was, all right, what if we build a 200,000 square foot medical office space? Again, using the traffic count and standards by the Institute of Transportation Engineering, 7,226 cars would traverse in and out of this site on a weekday. But the telling figure is the last one, the second page of this tab, which shows, based on the proposed traffic count for this project, 342 apartments, weekday traffic would be 2,197 trips. So that would be basically two-thirds of what the large office space would generate, and it would be one-third of the traffic that would be generated by a medical office building. So I think, again, one of the main uh, items that we want to stress to you in our uh, presentation to you is if traffic is going to be a consideration, we believe it's a non-issue. Bob has put together a traffic engineering report. Uh, it was uh, examined by the police commission. There were comments that were made by the police commission, and he responded to that uh, in the last tab. He'll be going over that uh, during his presentation. But there are going to be off-site improvements as well as removal of vegetation on the site to create greater sight lines that will clearly meet the standards for sight line distance uh, pursuant to industry standards, plus 
utilization of these off-site improvements on Schoolhouse Road near the intersection with Interstate 95. So I think, again, that's one of the main things that we want to stress to you is that we feel that we've covered that traffic issue adequately through those, uh, through those items. I mentioned the affordability plan to you. Again, it's the same document that I've gone through with you on other projects. That's item number one or tab number one uh, in the handout that I've given to you. And again, if you, if you flip to basically pages four and six of the affordability plan, based on the uh, median income standards uh, at uh, the 80% rate, the apartments, uh, one bedroom apartments would be uh, uh, rented to tenants at the rate of $1,150.40 a month. And for those uh, tenants at the 60% income rate, the rent monthly rent would be $910.63. Lastly, under tab three, uh, sub items A through H, I've attached all of the department reviews that uh, we've received. If you start with uh, tab 3A, we appeared before the Sewer Commission last fall, and the Sewer Commission on October 28th issued an approval for the hookup of the 342 uh, units on site. The next uh, review was from the Health Department, giving their approval and uh, just noting that prior con to construction of the pool, any plans and specifications needed to be submitted to Ms. Miller, who's the uh, Chief of Environmental Health for the Health Department, for their review. Tab 3C was the memo uh, of consideration from the Conservation Commission. The Conservation Commission went into discussion about maintaining the uh, conservation easement area, having signage delineating that area. If that's a condition of approval, that's certainly something that my clients will uh, agree to. Greg Podlusky, our city engineer in tab 3D, uh, made an initial review of the application and the plans in June of this year. He issued his memorandum, and I, keeping, in keeping things in sequence, I had Greg's memorandum attached to uh, Fred's response memorandum to him, which went back to him on July 20th. But the most important thing is the summary of this particular section. It's uh, Greg's memo back to uh, David and the board August 8th, saying that uh, all of his comments were satisfactorily responded to by Fred. So uh, it, these plans have received approval from uh, the engineering department. We had an interesting time with the fire marshal. The plans were first reviewed in February, and I attached the memo from the fire marshal uh, rejecting the plans in February. And our initial plans and the plans that were uh, shown to the Inland Wetlands Agency last fall and part of the approval from the, that agency showed an access road for fire trucks to get to the rear of the property utilizing pa uh, pavers. And I believe it was some 18 feet in width. And the fire marshal rejected the plan saying that he wanted a paved area, a paved driveway to the rear portion of the property uh, for fire access. So the plans were amended. Uh, it did necessitate an amendment of our inland wetlands approval because technically that was then uh, a change in terms of um, impervious surface within the review area of the wetlands agency. So we did have to go back to the wetlands agency and quite briefly, those two letters are attached for your review as well. The initial approval and then after two public hearings, uh, in June, the Wetlands Agency uh, um, approved the amended plans that uh, we had submitted. So these are all of the department reviews that have uh, gone through. The last item is the uh, police report, and I'm going to leave that to Bob to address in greater detail. But basically, uh, there were two things that the police commission noted in its report from uh, uh, Officer Hemperly, uh, sight lines as well as access to the building. And actually, I'm going to refer to David's summary memo that was issued to you today. I received it at about 4 o'clock this afternoon. And uh, 
one of David's comments refers to the police commission action and refers to the fact that the police commission rejected this in part because of improper access to the rear of the building. Well, unfortunately, I don't think that uh, a review was made of the fire marshal's uh, second report because once the plans were approved by the fire marshal and that full road was placed in the back of the building, com giving complete access uh, to the rear portion of the property and along the, uh, the building for the fire trucks to have access, uh, that addressed the issue that the police commission had raised in, in their memo. So that's the summary of the department reviews. I want to turn things over to Fred Maysher right now so that he can give you the details of the site plan and then the other gentleman will follow in order after him. And uh, as always, any questions, we're happy to entertain them at the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Lynch. Uh, although at this point um, we need to take a, a very short recess, probably about two, two or three minutes, uh, so Mo uh, Milford Government Access Television can address uh, technical issues with the recording. So we will stand in recess for about three minutes. Thank you very much. Attorney Lynch, please feel free to resume. Okay, for the record, my name is Fred Mesha. I'm a civil engineer with Tie and Bond, offices at 1000 Bridgeport Avenue, Shelton, Connecticut. Now, I'm probably going to repeat some of the stuff that Attorney Lynch went over, but it's, it's all part of my presentation. The first thing I'm going to do is talk about the existing conditions. Uh, if you don't know where the site is, uh, in your packet of plans on sheet CO.01, shows the existing conditions. The site is bounded on the north by I-95, on the south by Amtrak Metro North, uh, to the east by West Avenue, and to the west by Schoolhouse Road. The site is 57.3 acres. 27 of the 57 acres is actually uh, delineated wetlands or watercourses. Iroquois gas transmission line runs through the middle of the site. It was constructed back in the 90s, and it basically uh, goes from I-95 under the site, under the wetlands, and eventually goes under uh, Metro North, Bridgeport Avenue, and goes out towards the Sound. That's part of their gas line. It runs from Long Island to Canada. As Attorney Lynch mentioned, the property was Regional Water Authority. It was deeded to the Kingdom Life Church. And with that, there was three areas of the site delineated. There was a preservation use area that was about 31 and a half acres. And that is basically to be preserved in its entirety. With the only exception, trails could be built on that area. And if you remember, the were some trails on there, a boardwalk, which got destroyed in a fire years ago, and I believe the conservation uh, department is working to get that trail rebuilt. A second part of the conservation area is 10.6 acres, and it's a limited restricted area. It allows access to that area. And if I just go over the point on the lower portion of the site, is preservation area. Above that is a natural resource development conservation use. And like I said, that allows access into that preserved area. And what the water company left over was what they called DU or land development use, and that's about 15 acres. But out of that 15 acres, some of it is Beaver Brook, some of it is floodplain, some of it is also wetland areas. So, as a, and it's 
traversed by Iroquois gas transmission line. So as Attorney Lynch mentioned, out of that 15 acres, there's only about nine and a half to 10 that is physically usable for any type of development, whether it's under the current zone or any other proposed use. Portions of this land was remnants or was destroyed when I-95 was built in the 50s. If you go on a portion of the property, mainly towards the western side of it, you'll see a lot of uh, pine trees planted in nice straight rows. They're, they didn't naturally grow that way. That was a restoration project after the majority of the material was hauled off the site, gravel and soils that was used as part of I-95 reconstruction. With that, with I-95, the storm drainage of I-95 along its almost entire frontage of this property, basically from Schoolhouse Road to West Avenue, all the storm drainage from I-95 dumps onto the site. There's four points of discharge along the northern portion of property that comes off I-95. The two on the eastern side actually discharge into a upland metal area and doesn't cause much damage. But if you walk on the site over on the western side uh, along the entrance ramp onto 95, if you go onto the site, you can see where stormwater has caused a lot of erosion onto the site as well as debris from the roadway. There's a chain link fence that runs along the property. On that portion of the site, there's almost two feet of debris mixed with leaves and florist litter that has been coming off I-95 and degrading the site. There's a small wetland area right in the pocket there that if you go out there in the middle of the summer, the water level is very low and it's green. Uh, through our work with the Inland Wetland Agency, part of our approval with them is to go into that area and clean it up and make it a useful pond. It'll be part of the stormwater system, but basically clean up the debris. If you go out there now, there's feet of mud, debris, whatever people throw off the highway, because a good portion of the highway is higher than this site. So things just get flung off the highway, and if you go out there, you can see a lot of debris comes out into this property. So part of our approval with the wetland agency is to clean that up. Beaver Brook enters the site along West Avenue, uh, almost opposite the vicinity of the City of Milford pump station. Flows southerly direction, meanders through the site, and eventually over in its eastern corner, it goes into a culvert. That culvert eventually goes under Schoolhouse Road and empties into the next series of reservoirs. And before this all goes down to Long Island Sound, there's three or four uh, former reservoirs that was owned by a regional water agency that the water flows through. And also, as mentioned, there's the Iroquois gas pipeline beside the property right through the middle. That's a 24-inch gas main that was, like I said, built in the, in the 90s. Now I'll talk about the proposed improvements to the property. Uh, in general, as Attorney Lynch mentioned, there's two four-story apartment buildings, one on we call the west side, one on the east side, east and west of the gas line. One of them has a three and a half story parking garage, the other one has a four-story parking garage. Other than the parking garage, all, parking, all the parking on this site for these uh, apartment buildings is in structured parking. There is no surface parking lots proposed other than a few visitor spaces along the roadway that would be used as partly as a rental office in, you know, a quick visitor in and out on the business side of the apartment complex. But all residents that would live in this building would 
go into a parking garage. And from each level of the parking garage, Tim Gooding will show you that there's entrance into the building at each level. There's a site drive that enters the site from West Avenue, over near where the existing sewer treatment plant is, runs through the site, parallel to I-95, then it makes a, almost a 90 degree turn, crosses Beaver Brook, and it'll come back out on the schoolhouse road. That driveway is proposed to be 28 feet wide as per requirements of the fire marshal. On both sides, where it intersects with the city streets, there'll be a concrete curved apron and sidewalks along that portion of the frontage. As Attorney Lynch mentioned, we originally had a 18-foot walkway, paver block, fire access road along the southern portion of the building so that the entire buildings had access for the fire department. In dealing with the fire marshal, they were opposed to the grass paver blocks. They were looking for a 28-foot roadway wherever a fire truck would have to stop, set up its outriggers to be able to service the building. So the roadway that the fire marshal eventually approved varies between 18 feet and 28 feet. It's 18 feet at the corners of the buildings, but any place away from the building is 28 feet wide. And it's not because a fire truck is 28 feet wide. A typical fire truck is eight and a half to nine feet wide, but when they set up their largest either ladder truck or snorkel truck, the outriggers require a paved area of 28 feet. That's the reason the roadways are set at 28 feet for fire access. The site will be serviced with underground utilities. Uh, the sewer will go out to West Avenue into this gravity line that's in West Avenue connecting to the, to the uh, existing pump station. A portion of the site, the western side of the site, because of the grade elevations, will require a on-site pump station that will be owned and maintained by uh, this project. But all sanitary sewer will eventually come and discharge into the sewer in West Avenue. Water protection, water main will come off of West Avenue, a 12-inch main basically will follow the main road and the fire service road and make a loop around the building with, I believe, five or six hydrants on the main road and four or five hydrants on the fire service road. And that was uh, reviewed with Regional Water Authority. They have adequate pressure to provide that. And the fire marshal was pleased that we're putting his service road in as well as fire hydrants behind the buildings. So if he does have to come there to fight a fire, he has adequate service around the entire building. The site also has site also has some floodplain issues that need to be addressed. Beaver Brook is in the FEMA designated flood area. Uh, Beaver Brook itself is the main floodway. On this plan that's in your packet is sheet C 7.00. You can see in the orange areas, and I believe your plans were printed in color also, the two orange areas are the areas that are delineated from FEMA as part of floodplain areas. Those areas we're proposing to fill and replicate or compensate for that in another area, which on this plan is shown in the dark blue area. So basically, we would be applying after we get to the local commissions, we would be applying for FEMA for map amendment to allow us to fill the area and compensate 
the floodplain storage in a different location of the site. Also, there's two parts of the floodplain. You have the floodway area, which is the stream proper, and that's the, a corridor along Beaver Brook, which is about 75 to 80 feet wide. After that, in the wetlands area, there's a floodplain area, which is basically the overbank area. So we have the proposed roadway crossing the floodway. Rather than do it with a culvert, we're proposing a bridge crossing. In your plan packet, there's a drawing called C1.02. And that's basically the western side of the site access road. In that drawing, we also show a proposed bridge crossing of that. So the floodway is about, like I said, 75 to 80 feet wide to avoid any issues with encroaching into that floodway. We're setting the bridge two feet above the flood elevation and we're spanning the entire floodway and the bridge that we're proposing is a 100 foot span. It's a private driveway but the design, the bridge will be designed for highway loading and would follow DOT criteria or the Federal Highway Administration criteria for that type of drive, uh, roadway crossing of a bridge. It would be a similar bridge that it would be on any city street, it happens to be a private driveway, but we, uh, in planning the project, we figured that is the best way to do it, is not try to go in with a culvert or something, span the obstacle uh, it's adding uh, some aesthetic value to the site. If you can, when you look at your plan and your package, you can see the, the bridge will probably lend itself very well to the architecture that Tim Gooding has uh, proposed. As I mentioned before, this site has frontage on West Avenue Schoolhouse Road. We have a site driveway entering from Schoolhouse Road in West Avenue. Both are proposed to be two-way traffic. So a resident inside living in here can enter or exit from either driveway. Bob will go through the numbers of what the proposed distribution is, but uh, the site has full access to both roadways. The other utilities that it will be serviced by is Electric service will be by United Illuminating. Uh, Attorney Lynch mentioned that we did receive approval from the Milford WPCA to make a connection. And then the telecommunications utilities would be either through Frontier Communications or Cablevision. But all normal overhead utilities will be placed on the ground. There will be no overhead utilities. The only utility that you'll see on here above ground will be the street lighting that Iris will go over when he does his mutation. As I mentioned, the site access road coming out on the schoolhouse roadside does fill a small wetland. Uh, we could not avoid that. We are permitted by the wetland agency to do that, as well as this area from here is the degra degraded or impacted pond that is part of the wetlands application. Uh, my clients or our clients will uh, be cleaning that up and trying to restore that to a much better condition than it is now. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of debris coming off the I-95 and a good portion of it, if you go out on the site today, and the old schoolhouse road used to come through the site over in that far western corner, if you go down there, you'll see a lot of debris, a lot of erosion, from the stormwater that comes off I-95. We've talked to, to DOT and because it's not affecting state property, they don't have an issue with it. Eventually when they hopefully come through and do some safety improvements to this, this section 95, like they've been doing in other towns, they'll address the drainage. But until then, we have to do something for it. So in our site plan, we're proposing a two compartment detention basin over in the western corner that allows the state drainage from I-95 to come into the site and allows us to have a containment cell so that the debris can be 
concentrated in one area and then that could be cleaned out because right now it just flows th freely over two or three acres of the site and anytime you go out there you'll see the damage from the erosion as well as the garbage and debris coming off the state highway. It's, it's amazing how much material comes off. For the impervious areas of the site access road, the parking garages, and the residential units, we have proposed five underground infiltration detention systems. And they are scattered uh, throughout the site. I'll just point to them quickly. They're on the plan that you have. Two, three, four, five. There's five of them that service that. When we originally had the fire road that was a walking trail, a grass paver block for the fire department. We weren't worried about infiltration or runoff from that area because it would infiltrate. Uh, the walking trail would have been a porous material and the grass block was a porous material. When the fire department, when the fire marshal came back and said he wants a paved hard surface, we had to figure out what to do with the storm water and this is a very good application and a wetlands commission approved, uh, agency agreed with us that the fire access road from the point it enters the site driveway around the back of the buildings to the other side where it intersects with the site access road again would be porous asphalt. And I'm not sure if anybody in the commission has experience with it, but it, when you drive on porous asphalt, it looks like normal asphalt that you would see on city roads. It can handle the loads. The difference is it's got a porous nature to it that when water hits it, it does not run off like normal asphalt. It infiltrates into the, into the asphalt. And what this porous asphalt would be, four inches of bituminous concrete asphalt over top of a 12-inch crushed stone base. So any water running off onto that will be infiltrating to the ground. Normally, a service road would have curbs and catch basins and have to discharge someplace. We opted for the porous asphalt. Now, we do get a question about using porous asphalt quite a bit, and there are limitations where it can be used. The biggest problem is if you have a small site, if you're doing a half acre site, you think, okay, use porous asphalt, it will solve the stormwater problems. In theory, it could. Problem is when you talk to the vendors of porous asphalt, that's too small of a site for them to rematch their asphalt plant to, to pave. So it's got to be something that is a sizable area of a material so that when they re, because they have to shut the plant down, retool it, and set it up for porous asphalt. It's got to be a large enough area. I've known sometimes there's projects where they, 10 parking spaces, want to make porous asphalt. Economically, it's not feasible for the plants to produce a material, but we propose it for here. It's a large quantity. The Wetlands Commission actually liked the idea and it was part of the approval. Uh, one of their notes was because we were using porous asphalt. In the engineering report that was submitted along with the application, there's full computations of all the storm drainage, also a proposed maintenance inspection plan for the storm drainage systems. In your package, you also have soil erosion control plans that are on sheets C5.0 through 5.2. The plans have been prepared in accordance with state uh, erosion control guideline manual 2002. Floodplain, as, as I mentioned before, we know the site has some floodplain areas that we're proposing to fill. We have to submit a, a CLOMAR, which is, there's two steps to it. A CLOMAR is a conditional letter of map uh, revision. is usually done before a project is proposed. Once the, or you can go and build a project and then file for a LOMAR, which is uh, a 
a map amendment and we would be doing it based on fill. We generally don't go to the federal agencies until we get input from local agencies. As Attorney Lynch mentioned, we've already received our approval from Inland Wetlands Agency, WPCA, Milford City Engineering Department has reviewed the plans and uh, said that they satisfied all his requirements. Milford Fire Department. Now, the other permits that are required for this project, if this commission decides to approve it, is it's a long list. We have one, and Bob uh, Jurison will go over it a little bit. OSTA, Office of State Traffic Administration, they need to approve the project because there's over 200, 200 cars proposed or over 100,000 square feet of space. For the bridge crossing, the wetlands filling, and the pond reconstruction, we're going to need a permit for the Army Corps of Engineers. And with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, a sister permit that goes along with that is a 401 water quality certification from the Connecticut DEP. Those permits will be filed simultaneously and they, they work together on those. When the project goes to construction, because the proposed activity is disturbing more than 10 acres, we, well, any project requires a stormwater construction activity plan from Connecticut DEP because this is over 10 acres. It'll face a much higher level of review. Actually, I think because we're over 10 acres, we'll, we'll prepare the, the application, but a third party reviewer would have to review that to sign off on it before the permit is issued from the Connecticut DEP. And I think I covered most of it. Uh, if not, other people pick up on it. But what you see there is a f uh, the site plan that's rendered over there is probably after six months of working out uh, a configuration that w works with the site, takes into account the uh, site restrictions. I think when we first started this project, we were well over 450 units, 600 plus parking spaces. Uh, completely different configuration. By changing the configuration and working with the architect and landscape architect, we feel we have a, a plan that opens up the site, saves quite a bit of space. I'm not sure if any of you have looked at some of these other large scale apartment complexes, like Attorney Lynch mentioned, Stanford and Oak. A lot of those are in smaller limited lots. So when you go by them, you're just seeing hate to say and not to offend the architects, is a big box. What Tim has done with this one was got rid of the big box and made it a long linear building that almost every apartment has a view of something, either the interior courtyards or the vast open space uh, across the wetlands. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eris to go through the landscape. Good evening, Aristalis, principal with Aris Land Studio, landscape architects. Our office is located on Barnum Avenue in Bridgeport. Um, I want to thank Attorney Lynch for the kind words at the start saying how wonderful we are. Um, and I think it really was a great team effort, what came together here. As, as Fred was saying, we started out with a much bigger building, a lot more parking, and we kept looking at the site to come up the best with the best scenario. And after each iteration, it was, okay, who's gonna call the Grillo brothers to say, okay, we cut back some of your units again. So that was kind of the 
okay, well, you tell them we have less, because that's always the issue that comes up is trying to, to get the most out of something. Well, what I think we came up with is actually we got the best out of something. Um, the orientation is designed to take, you know, get the most out of the, the open space that remains on the site. Out of these 57 acres, much of the residents here in these buildings are looking at the wetlands. Plus, we have the southern orientation. So each of these little pockets is going to be capturing the sunlight and creating these different solar pockets. And so we, we sought to create was this um, a, a place that, that's a community with people having a larger community space, place plus a number of intimate spaces. I'm going to take this off. Part of this, the plan, um, the gas uh, line that p cuts through the site, people could have looked at and said, well, that's an uh, impediment. What, what are we doing with that? But we saw it as an opportunity to actually kind of use this as open grassland space and having plantings like little blue stem that is basically becomes open space through the center. And then we end up with a nice trail that passes through it so that this ties into this greater walking system that we have for this site, which then ties into the trails that are part of the 57 acres. And if you go to those trails today on West Avenue, you can't get in there. It's so overgrown. Forget about the fact that it's covered with poison ivy today, which granted poison ivy is good because it's a native plant, but it's not conducive to people walking on trails. But, you know, so it really, what happens is we've got people, you know, oriented towards the wetlands, towards that open space. The areas in the center here on the, on the, the, uh, the western portion is a children's play area along with a shelter that includes also a water feature. So when you're driving into the, the parking garages, that becomes a visual amenity. That's, it's not only just visual, but it's also sound within this courtyard space. Across from there is a pool area that, again, has another shade area because people are much more sensitive now to the sun. Gone from 30 years ago, everyone baked themselves, and I know Actually, my wife says she used to put baby oil on when she was young. People, at least people don't do that anymore. So there's, there's shade here, and it really takes advantage of the orientation of the sun, having the pool area here. Now, in each of these pockets, we've created small little gathering spaces, either just a small sitting area or other areas with uh, little barbecue pits. So people can go out because you can't barbecue on in your apartment, but at least you can come outside and, you know, look at the wildlife, especially when you've got a space like this. There's, there's tons of birds here. It really is incredible, um, the environment here. So we're creating opportunities for those small, either family gatherings or just to get outside when you're just wound up and, you know, it's a you know, January, February day, when the sun is shining here, it's going to be a nice little warm pocket to be outside and just get some vitamin D. And so those kind of pockets are scattered here to, again, take advantage of the solar orientation. Our entrance into the site is d designed to kind of let you know that you've arrived with, you know, uh, stonework and a, and a sign that says, as, as Attorney Lynch said, this is a premier complex. It's not just you're, you're coming in someplace. The lighting we've chosen for the site is, utilizes timber poles. And it's not just a you know, cheap pole that you'd get out of, you know, like a telephone pole, but these are actually structural timbers that will outlast all of us uh, for probably 100 years. So, along the, the drive where the vehicles will be moving, 
is we have 20 foot poles and then the same style but a much shorter fixture is along the pedestrian path here along the southern border. Now one of the things we didn't do was along the western drive out to Schoolhouse Road we didn't put street lighting there. We just have it at the entrance of Schoolhouse Road again to minimize the amount of sight lighting that we have so we're not just lighting everything. It's not intended as a as a busy city street and I'm kind of a, one of these people that thinks less is more. We just don't need as much light especially when you know you're driving at a very slow speed through here. I think one of the, one of the issues just kind of as a as a housekeeping uh, piece the um, city engineer mentioned you know had a question about the soils in the wetland areas and that was addressed in Matt Davison's wetland report if you look at the mitigation measures on pages 12 um, and 13 we, we talk about how the plantings for the wetland areas will be coordinated with the Inland Wetlands Agency uh, and Mary Rose to make sure that we comply with their needs but it's also kind of once we're in construction it's better understanding what is happening with the water at the time so you know what plants to put in at the right elevations because you put some plants in too deep and they're just all going to die and then the soil mixtures will be a a 50-50 mixture of topsoil with organic materials and it's a good thing because the grillos manufacture compost and topsoil. And as we mentioned that the, the unit is it's you know over 400 units now we're at four, 342 and I believe we really created a, a livable community that will be a strong asset to Milford. Um, Oh, and the, the, there were some questions about codes that came out in one of the, from the letter yesterday. And the plans we're representing are kind of the, the, the big picture. Some of the, the stairways that exit to the public ways will be at grade with walkways to assure code compliance is met. And that especially when we go through the health department, which because this is a public pool, they have very strict guidelines in terms of what you have to have for uh, showering before going into a pool, the fence requirements and everything. Um, everything here will more than comply with the state, uh, state code requirements. And we'll be here for additional questions. And now I'll let uh, Tim take over. Good evening. I'm Tim Gooding of Gooding Architecture at 135 Bedford Street in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, I would like to discuss some of the main features of the property that influenced our proposed design. There's, of course, the marsh, which is a great amenity and feature. And there is I-95, which is a noise consideration for us. And third, as was mentioned before, it's a very large property, but it's a very restricted amount of land that we can use. Um, so taking those factors into account, the design concept looks to optimize the number of apartments that face the marsh and face south, and to use the building layout as a buffer from the highway. Mr. Gooding, could you move the microphone closer to your face? Okay. Thank you. Is that good? The, um, we located the parking structures on the north side between the apartments and the highway to mitigate the noise. The residential buildings wrap around the garage, garages on the south side, um, in maximizing the number of apartments facing the marsh and the southern exposure. Another design concept is to have a series of open courtyards, as Aris mentioned. Uh, this uh, this um, 
uh, again increases the number of apartments with views, but also breaks up the overall building with these smaller groupings. We use the gap created by the, gap, by the pipeline to create a shared open space between the two buildings. The lobbies and the, amenity, the amenities for the uh, property are located off of that central open space. The resident amenities include a pool, a pool house, a common club room that residents can use as a recreation space. These amenities are similar to what we provide in our other luxury rental projects in Fairfield County. Regarding the architectural style of the buildings, we've adopted a traditional This residential style and scale is created by using several design strategies. We varied the facade materials. We used clabbered siding, vertical board and batten siding, and stone veneer in certain areas. We also vary the siding colors throughout. We added interest to the sloped roof lines by mixing in gables, hip roofs, and dormers, and even some standing seam metal roofs. Also, we added residential type decorative elements such as brackets at the eaves, gable brackets, and eyebrow roofs. So we're just talking about these kind of decorative elements up here, brackets, This variety of architectural elements gives the project a residential scale. The individual apartment layouts are similar to the ones we have built at other high-end rental projects. So the apartments have nine-foot ceilings and walk-in closets. All the apartments have private balconies. The interior finishes are upscale with stone countertops and stainless steel appliances. The top floor apartments have cathedral ceilings and lofts overlooking the living rooms, which makes these units particularly desirable and luxurious. The unit square footages are closer in size to condominium units rather than typical rental apartments. Finally, in terms of the building code, the residential buildings are fully sprinklered they will have the firewalls required between the garage and the residential. The building will meet all the safety requirements of the state building code. Uh, there was a statement issued by the building department a couple days ago saying that the building cannot be built as shown, and I believe that is not really accurate. Uh, I have extensive experience. I've had more than 20 years doing these types of projects, done more, completed more than 16 with over 2,000 apartments, and Currently, I'm assisting the City of Norwalk Building Department in reviewing a very large mixed-use project. Uh, I do have long experience and expertise in this, and the building will not need to grow or get higher or change in any way. There's minor details that you go through. This is not a building permit application. It's zoning. It's the general idea of the building. But it, all the elements are there. All right, thank you. Good evening. I'm Bob Jurison, uh, Senior Traffic and Transportation Consultant with Tie and Bond. 
I'm a registered uh, professional engineer in the state of Connecticut and uh, have over 40 years experience in traffic engineering and transportation planning, focusing on traffic impact studies for land development projects. As Attorney Lynch mentioned, I had the honor and privilege of serving on uh, my town's Weathersfield's Planning and Zoning Commission for 22 years, of which uh, two terms as chair. So it's, uh, it's a, both a rewarding and challenging uh, position in, in, for your town. Uh, I work with Fred and uh, Craig Yanis, our uh, project traffic engineer on this project, and here tonight to uh, present our traffic study. We conducted a full traffic impact study, meeting all the uh, uh, procedures and standards in our profession, as well as all the requirements by the State of Connecticut uh, Office of State Traffic Administration as it relates to traffic impact studies. We conducted a full field reconnaissance observing traffic operations. Uh, we conducted traffic counts at uh, the key intersections in the study area. We developed peak hour traffic volumes for the proposed project. We distributed that traffic onto the roadway system based on existing travel patterns. We projected traffic to the year 2020, the time the project is expected, uh, if approved, to be in operation. And we analyzed existing conditions, future conditions without the project's traffic, and future conditions with the, uh, with the uh, project's traffic. We identified areas of concern, and we developed traffic roadway improvements uh, in addressing those areas of concern. Our report is dated uh, February 10th, 2017, and is part of your package to the town for this application. With respect to the project and, and the traffic, during the, the two critical hours that are commuter hours, during the uh, weekday uh, AM commuter hour, the project is anticipated to generate about 172 vehicles, of which 138 vehicles will be uh, exiting the site and 34 vehicles entering the site. During the PM peak hour, which, it, which is the hour that has the highest traffic volumes on the roadway system, uh, there will be 205 projected traffic volumes by this project, of which 72 will exit the site and uh, 134 will enter the site. Um, based on uh, existing conditions, about 75 percent of those traffic volumes of the site are oriented to the west, uh, excuse me, the Schoolhouse Road uh, driveway and 25% to the West Avenue driveway. Of the 75% oriented to Schoolhouse Road, approximately 60% are oriented to uh, uh, the I-95 interchange, interchange 35. Our analysis uh, did show uh, what you're experiencing when you go out there during the peak hours, and that is congestion and um, uh, unacceptable congestion as it relates to the existing conditions. Uh, as it relates to the site traffic, uh, the, the uh, PMP commuter hour has the highest level of traffic volumes on Schoolhouse Road uh, underneath the uh, I-95 bridge. Our traffic will uh, add about uh, under 5 percent of that traffic. Uh, to the total traffic uh, volumes. So it's not a major traffic generator in the sense of adding significant traffic volumes to the roadway system. Even with that, we felt, uh, given the congestion that's out there, to uh, develop and present some roadway improvements for consideration. And this illustration should be bigger, and I apologize, uh, shows those roadway improvements. Uh, right now, Schoolhouse Road is one lane in each direction, no turning, no turning lanes. Uh, we're, we're proposing to uh, uh, restripe the road uh, and create left turn lanes 
for traffic uh, uh, oriented to turn left on I-95 northbound on-ramp, as well as left turns to go to I-95 southbound, southbound uh, on-ramp. So it will become a three-lane cross-section underneath the bridge, uh, providing turn lanes onto the two ramps. We also feel uh, a traffic control system, uh, more than what is out there today, is appropriate. Uh, so we analyzed uh, the roadway system, system having those, the, the two key intersections, uh, the ramps on north, the northbound ramp system with schoolhouse and the southbound ramp system with schoolhouse to be all-way stop conditions. So there's no more speeding on the road, everyone's stopping uh, and giving the right of way to the person already stopped as you would in any intersection that has uh, all-way stop conditions. The site, the site drives themselves. You can see on this illustration, uh, the site drive onto Schoolhouse Road uh, is a two-lane uh, roadway, one lane inbound, one lane outbound, and uh, the outbound lane on Schoolhouse Road is controlled by a stop sign on the uh, site driveway. The driveway to West Avenue mirrors the one on Schoolhouse Road, one lane in, one lane out, with a stop sign controlling the uh, outbound lane onto West Avenue. We looked at uh, site distances and their uh, detail in our traffic study at both locations for, uh, because of the concern about speeds uh, on the roads as well as potential impediments to site distance. Uh, on taking Schoolhouse Road first, the site drive on Schoolhouse Road looking towards the interstate has well over 700 feet of site distance, so that uh, uh, clearly exceeds uh, the site distance requirements. By the way, the site distance requirements are based on the travel speed studies that we did and the calculations that we did uh, noting uh, the, the speed limits uh, on, on both roads are around 43 miles per hour, well over the 25 miles per hour that is on West Avenue and 35 miles per hour that is in school, Schoolhouse Road. Um, staying with uh, the site drive on Schoolhouse Road, and we actually measured the site distance looking, uh, uh, looking uh, looking left uh, towards the crest of the uh, schoolhouse that goes over the railroad bridge. Uh, and um, those site distances are in our report. Sir, if you could take the microphone with you as you uh, yeah. speak of the right. photographs. Ahead, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, the, site, the site distances uh, looking uh, on Schoolhouse Road, it, looking towards the crest of the road, uh, is around 475, is more than 478 feet, which is the required site distance for, uh, is the required site distance based on that 43 mile an hour uh, uh, speed, operating speed. Uh, now, those, that particular site distance uh, was actually measured uh, by Craig Janis, uh, our, this, the traffic engineer on the project, uh, while there was no vegetation on the, on the, uh, on the no leaves on the vegetation uh, uh, yet uh, in the early spring. And so uh, we know from those measurements that the required site distance uh, is is attained with the uh, clearing of those uh, shrubs looking in that direction. On West Avenue, we have the same thing. Looking uh, right on West Avenue, looking to the, to the east, uh, we have well over 700 feet of sight distance as compared to the 478 that's required. Looking to the, to the left, looking towards the I-95 uh, bridge and its abutment, uh, that one was measured by Fred, and we have over 478 feet there now, uh, 
except now the leaves have grown on that vegetation and it's restricted. So in both instances, uh, uh, we recommend to uh, get to that required uh, uh, site distance based on the 43 mile an hour operating speeds by clearing the obtrusive uh, uh, shrubs in those both directions, uh, one on West Avenue uh, uh, looking west uh, and the other one on, um, on Schoolhouse Road looking towards the crest of the road. Uh, obviously, if we use the, the speed limits, the uh, sight distances would be considerably less, well under 350 feet on, on both roads. So uh, we do exceed uh, the site distance, uh, site distance requirements uh, for the, for the uh, speeds on the road. It's important to also point out that uh, Motel 6 uh, has a driveway which, will be, which is closer to the crest of the road on Schoolhouse Road and uh, based on our investigations there were no recorded accidents uh, at that drive uh, over the last three years that we did the accident uh, investigation. Uh, just to touch upon uh, the police um, division of the police report, they talked about uh, three issues uh, in their denial. One is the uh, road need for a road around uh, the rear of the building and, and uh, it was Fred met, testified, and you've seen on the plans, that was put in in working with uh, the fire department uh, in uh, providing that road. Uh, also, uh, the site distances. Those site distances are actual field measurements that we meet the site distance requirements of 478 feet uh, uh, with, without uh, the leaves uh, interfering with that site distance and so part of the recommendations is to uh, remove those uh, vegetation obstructions. And the third one was uh, the concern of adding traffic to an already uh, congested uh, roadway. Um, well, any development adds traffic uh, to a roadway the, the issue is how do you deal with that? How do you handle, how do you handle that? And we handle that by uh, proposing, rec uh, proposing improvements in our traffic uh, study that would add lanes, led, add left turn lanes, as well as add traffic controls uh, at all approaches uh, to the two intersections on Schoolhouse Road and the, uh, and the uh, southbound and northbound ramp system. Uh, just to mention, just to talk about uh, Connecticut Department of Transportation uh, for a minute, um, this project is required to go through the uh, Office of State Traffic Administration process, uh, and uh, it will uh, uh, at the proper time after receiving your approvals. Uh, and um, whatever the, whatever the uh, requirements are as it relates to the responsibility of uh, this applicant uh, will be what it has to be. And during that process, there will be coordination with the state uh, and the town uh, so that uh, there's an understanding uh, by all three parties of what those uh, ro ro roadway improvements responsibilities are. The DOT is currently studying this interchange uh, now. That's also mentioned in the police department's report uh, because they too recognize uh, the congestion that's there today uh, and, um, and hopefully they do something about it. If not, these improvements here uh, should uh, uh, satisfy uh, the, the relatively small impact of this project. I want to conclude by saying that based on our study, this traffic generated by the project will be relatively small and the resultant traffic impact will be relatively minor. But most importantly, 
the roadway improvements on Schoolhouse Road at the I-95 interchange will offset any traffic condition changes by the project and, res and result in reduced congestion and delay and enhanced safety of the area, comparing not only to the future conditions, but, in, but improves, improved, uh, uh, reduced congestion and, and, and improved safety under existing and future conditions uh, with the project. Thank you, and I'm here for any questions. Thank you. Attorney Lynch, do you have anything further at this time? Mr. Chairman, that concludes our presentation to you. I would just like to add a concluding comment that um, uh, you just heard a very professional presentation by individuals who put a lot of time and effort into the site development of this property. Um, as you know, the standard is set forth in the statute is to uh, address any health and safety issues that may arise. I think that um, the fire department has reviewed these plans and uh, has found the buildings to be safe and the site developments to be safe. Um, we did receive comments from the uh, police commission and we made responsive comments to that report. They were submitted to Keith Mello, the uh, uh, police chief by way of correspondence from uh, Tigan Bond. Um, that was last week. We asked for uh, any further comments from the police commission. So uh, I'm assuming that this public hearing will remain open and uh, if so, uh, we'll seek to try to get a response from the police commission to the comments that Mr. Uh, uh, Janice made uh, in his report. and. Uh, uh, the presentation to you tonight. But I submit to you that we've met the standards of the statute. This is a uh, just, I think it's a fantastic project. It's located on a piece of property that lends itself to development of a very small area, leaving a substantial portion over 80% of the property uh, as open space. And these are just beautiful buildings uh, designed to create uh, a living environment that will really be a, a showcase for Milford. So uh, that's the conclusion of our comments. If there's any board questions, we can address those at this time, or if you want to open it up to public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Lynch. Mr. Sulkis, do you have comments on the application? I have some questions for uh, the presenters. Please proceed. I'll start with um, uh, Mr. Jurison. Um, in the uh, police report, it, uh, they claim that the uh, site distance on Schoolhouse Road uh, toward the highway uh, doesn't meet the minimum requirement because of the bridge abutments. Um, do you have a comment on that? Um, can you repeat that? I don't yeah, uh, in the police report, uh, and I can refer you to... Yeah, I have it right here. Okay. Um, I guess from the... You talked about West Avenue site distance to the... Bridge yeah, the, in, the, in, the par, in the paragraph that starts uh, one, two, three, right. fourth down, using the information from your study, that paragraph. Yes. Okay. And there, uh, about midway down there, uh, it talks about um, the traffic study by time bond states that the removal of vegetation near the exit, uh, the sight line will be greater than 478 feet. The traffic division believes that even with the removal of the vegetation in the area, the overpass of I-95 will interfere with the sight line and it will still be under the required 478 feet, thus creating a hazard to yeah, motorists. I apologize. I thought you said the bridge abutment on Schoolhouse Road. That's why I was confused when you first started. It's the bridge abutment on West Avenue. Okay. I apologize. I think I might have said, I think I did say Schoolhouse Road. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and, um, Yes, uh, as was mentioned, we actually responded basically point by point in, in, a, in a letter uh, to the uh, police chief uh, on Friday, I think it went in. And, uh, and we, we addressed that one as well as the, the other points. Uh, the actual site distance is uh, 
well over the uh, required, is, is over the required sight distance. The bridge abutment, actually with the, the, the curve of the road and the bridge abutment, and, and the sight distance measurements are actually in the site plan package. And that particular one was actually uh, measured by Fred. Uh, without the leaves on the bushes, uh, you can see the, to the other side, uh, of, you can see clearly th throughout the entire, I'll call it a tunnel, but the overpass on, on West Avenue to the other side of the bridge of, I on nine, of over, you know, I-95 bridge over West Avenue. So uh, I don't, you know, we welcome uh, a further review uh, and welcome to be out in the field uh, with the person who made that comment uh, to uh, demonstrate we can meet the site distance. Okay, thank you. And then um, regarding the um, traffic study and the impacts of uh, congestion, you know, of uh, you know further development, when when you were doing your research, did you take into account uh, farther up Schoolhouse Road, not that far up Schoolhouse Road, when it becomes Big Drive, the uh, uh, approved uh, uh, affordable housing complex? Uh, that's less than a half a mile from you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I apologize for not mentioning it, but when we developed uh, 2020 traffic volumes, we added uh, uh, the traffic volumes by Gordon Homes of Milford to the roadway system, as well as grew uh, existing traffic uh, to 2000, then added those traffic, and then added our traffic, uh, our traffic to that. Yes, sir. We did do that. Great, thank you. Um, I now have questions for Fred. Hello. Hi. Um, a question about the um, uh, uh, pervious asphalt that uh, it makes up the, uh, the roadway uh, behind the buildings, the, uh, the emergency uh, access. Yes. Um, what's the... Um, the lifespan of of that uh, pervious asphalt, and at what rate does it become less pervious? I, I know that's an issue that has come up when I go to my planning conferences, and uh, uh, over time, the Yukon studies have shown that uh, pervious uh, asphalt slowly becomes impervious asphalt. Pervious asphalt <clears throat> needs a different maintenance program than regular asphalt. Regular asphalt in the wintertime, public works sands the roads. Pervious asphalt, you don't want it to, them to sand the road. There's no need for it because there's no ice buildup on the porous asphalt. The biggest culprit with porous asphalt is not sand, it's actually leaf matter. Leaf fall they decompose and they penetrate porous asphalt. And the only way you can clean porous asphalt is not with the backpack leaf blowers and the push behind leaf blowers. It's basically a leaf vacuum to get the material out of the pores. As far as long term, it's designed for the same lifespan as regular asphalt, 20 to 25 years. Unfortunately, we don't have 25 years of real-time experience. But the people that pretty much wrote the book on porous asphalt is the University of New Hampshire. And they believe, I believe they have 10 plus years of winters experiencing porous asphalt. And the system works. Uh, it just needs to be maintained differently. Typically, when you get a parking lot, come springtime, the landscape contractors are all out there. First thing they do is go to the grillos, buy a load of mulch, triaxle comes and dumps it on the asphalt. Then they come out with all the wheelbarrows and little payloaders and distribute the mulch to all the planting beds. Poor asphalt, they can't do that because dumping the asphalt, the materials on the asphalt will cause the asphalt to clog. And the maintenance plan for poor asphalt, like I said, is not sweeping, it's vacuuming. And there are a lot of uh, 
equipment that can be utilized to vacuum the material out, same way that they use vax um, lawnmowers to pick up leaves, vac systems can pick up the debris that falls on the asphalt. Seeing this is not proposed as an everyday road, it's a fire service road, walking trail, there will be no need to use the icers or sanding on it to keep it clear. But porous asphalt doesn't need to do that. Water doesn't build up on it. There's a uh, stone base underneath. When snow is on there, it's removed. Whatever is left, when it melts, it infiltrates through the asphalt into the stone. It's not like everybody has a driveway, they get a little bird bath, you can't clean all the snow, that stuff melts, refreezes overnight, and then you get ice spots. You don't get that with the porous asphalt. So I hope I answered your questions. Almost. Almost? Yeah. The, um, mo or I'll say mostly. Okay. Uh, the uh, University of New Hampshire obviously has been doing this and has studies on its effectiveness over time. Can you provide us with information? Because again, my understanding is even in a well-maintained uh, situation that over time, the effectiveness of the uh, ability uh, to permeate the asphalt will, will degrade over time. And I'm just curious as to what rate that would occur. And if it occurs at whatever rate that is, do we actually have a, a, a drainage issue here where it's not at some point going to be going through and, and into the wetlands? Okay. I can't answer that question right now. We'll get the information for you. But as a side note, our tie-in bonds, Port Smith, New Hampshire office has been working with the University of New Hampshire for many years on this particular item, poor asphalt parking lots. We've designed many of them. So I will talk to the people in our Portsmouth office and try to get an answer to your question. Very good, thank you. Okay. And that's it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sulkis. Are there questions from the board for the presenters? Seeing none, at this time, we will uh, open the public hearing to public comment. And on behalf of the board, I want to welcome our neighbors and fellow residents. The public uh, hearing procedure, if you could um, approach the podium, please state your name, your address, and uh, please do your best to limit your comments to three minutes at a time. Uh, we have many people that would like to uh, be heard uh, by the commission and raise points uh, to, the, to the applicants. Um, after everyone has had the opportunity to speak once, if you want to speak again, you certainly can do so. Uh, I ask that you address all of your comments to the board and not the applicant. And uh, please um, certainly uh, uh, exercise all decorum and uh, good manners uh, that, uh, that I know we're going to, uh, to exercise. So first I would ask if anyone wishes to speak in favor of the application to please come forward. Seeing none, at this time I'll ask anyone who wishes to speak against the application to please come forward. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. I'm sorry I don't have a strong voice, but I think you can hear me with the microphone. My name is Cheryl Morgan, and I live at 11 McHale Lane, which is part of Gloria Commons. And I've lived there for 10 years. Um, I am against this project. We have had sewer gas in our units for the last 10 years. Even with the sewer system upgrades and the pump station upgrades, if there's a heavy rainstorm, we still get sewer gas coming in. So with the size of this project here, there will be a lot more sewage going into the Beaverbrook pump station. And I don't think that would be uh, healthy or beneficial to any of us, whether at Gloria Commons or at this project. Um, the other issue that I have concerns about is with all of the development that is going on within Milford. And this is a very huge development project here. This year we have been seeing a pack of coyotes 
on our property which have been approaching us. Um, one person had a coyote on her front porch when she went to take her dog out. I took one of my dogs out and I was confronted with, by two coyotes. And um, they are coming up close to the buildings. These animals are being displaced. They have nowhere to go. There's also fisher cats in the Beaver Brook uh, trails. There's other animals of concern. Um, I talked to the police department. They won't come out. I talked to animal control. They don't deal with wild animals. I talked to the Department of Environmental Protection. They don't relocate animals. So as this moves forward, if it's approved, there are going to be more and more animals that are going to uh, move to our wetland area within Gloria Commons and also around Mondo Pond. So those are my two major concerns. Thank you. My name is Paula Sherko. I, my husband and I live at 26 Lucius Court in the Gloria Commons complex. We're against this complex being built uh, for safety factors. On West Avenue, if you're coming from Boston Post Road, you have a giant S curve. That S curve, in the, I would say about 10 days ago, three times there has been fender benders. Now, those are just cars. We're going to have, a, if this project goes through, we're going to have major trucks going through. And that's not going to help us. It's not going to help anybody that lives in that area. Another thing is the pump station, as um, the person before me spoke, I can smell it. It is horrible. You can't even go outside. We can't even go out the back of our condos you actually gag. It's like smelling gas and low tide at the same time. The other thing is the coyote situation. We have the deer. We've had deer getting killed literally between exit uh, entrance of 35 and exit of 36. Right there, we've had deer uh, strikes up on 95. The coyotes are getting out of control. I saw them I've also saw bobcats in our wooded area. Now, if gorillas going to relocate those animals, all well and good. What's going to happen also, there's no sidewalks on West Avenue. The road is not wide enough for trucks to go up and down. I've seen tractor trailer trucks try to make the S turn, and it's a joke. So I am totally against this whole project. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Ron Montfort, 7 McCall Lane, Gloria Commons. I'm a member of the board. I'd like to pass something out, if you don't mind. I printed, I printed these for the board members. I got four more copies. When I heard that Grillo was going to come back and put affordable housing, I researched it. I went and seen 80,000, 50,000, 60,000 of affordable housing being built around the state. I even realized just now I found that they completed 217 affordable housing in July, and currently under construction there's 3,286. About two weeks ago, I got a brochure from Representative Kim Rose. It was an eye-opener. She had on the bottom of her brochure, a much-needed moratorium on affordable housing was passed by both houses. Governor Malloy, in his stupid wisdom, vetoed the bill. But on July 24th, both houses overrode the veto. And in front of you right there, I'm just going to read a little summary. This act makes several changes in the affordable housing land use appeal procedures, which requires planning and zoning commissions to defend their decisions to deny affordable housing developments 
or approve them with certain conditions. Generally, the act makes it easier for municipalities to qualify for temporary suspension or moratoriums or exemptions from procedures. It also extends the length of moratoria for certain municipalities. Some of these changes and procedures terminate on September 30th, 2022. And on the bottom it says, by law, a developer cannot appeal under the procedure in a municipality which the DOH determines at least 10% of housing is affordable. And, and you know, there's six pages of this. I printed three. If you'd like the other six, you can look on the top there. There's Jason Knight. He can give you all six. It's an eye opener. And what it tells me is the representatives are listening to the people. You look around the state, there's a lot of affordable housing. I'm not against affordable housing. But they woke up and they said, the people saying enough is enough right now. Let's have a moratorium on it. And both houses passed it, and they overrode his veto by two-thirds. Malloy vetoed it, but it was overridden. That tells me that they're listening. And let's go to safety. I heard the study that he mentioned, all the survey study, that traffic is going to be fine. Let me give you my own study. I pull out of my driveway with the wife sitting next to me. I see three cars coming up West Avenue, four cars coming the other way. I wait, and I pull out. Unfortunately, when you get mature, I say mature, not elderly, your perception isn't as good, your reflexes aren't as good. I can just vision. He said, oh, we did the study and it's gonna be fine. They did the study when Grillo was gonna put his cop hose across the street. If there's only 342 apartments, 500 cars, 600 cars, if only 300 cars are on West Avenue, on any given time between Big Drive and, and US-1, the cement truck goes up and down the road four or five times a day, there could be 20 cars coming each way, there could be 10 cars coming each way. How does a mature elderly person take a chance and pull out? There could be a serious accident. Maybe not, but, but I think there could be. And I'm not gonna keep, I think it's gonna be a safety issue, and I'm against it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening. My name is Carol Penton. I live at 21 Lucius Court, part of the Gloria Commons complex. Um, with all these esteemed gentlemen here uh, at my side, not one of them mentioned that there's a uh, grammar if you school. Could, if you could be in front of the microphone. There's a, not one of them mentioned that there's a grammar school right across the street on West Avenue from where this proposed complex is. And um, uh, that to me, as a you know, as a mother, would be uh, rather a big concern with the number of cars that are projected to uh, be coming in and out of that that project. Now, my understanding about uh, the traffic would be that there would be a stop sign coming out of the complex onto Schoolhouse Road. Um, any of us from Milford that travel that road on a daily basis. Um, very often the traffic is backed up to the light on Schoolhouse Road, from the, po from the Boston Post Road to Schoolhouse Road and West Avenue. Um, just human nature being what it is, they, uh, traffic will not, for um, after a certain amount of time, people are gonna be smart enough and say, I can't get out on Schoolhouse Road, I'm gonna go down to West Avenue where that S-curve is. So I'm against this project mainly for that and also the traffic and for the fact that there's a, um, a middle school right on West Avenue, excuse me, a grammar school right on West Avenue across from this project. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marcia Tompkins. I live at 19 Lucius Court, Gloria Commons. My main concern is the pump station. There, it appears not to be able to handle the current load. When I call the town and frequently do, sometimes they say it's Gloria Commons' responsibility or the trash cans were out, 
but it is so bad on a nice cool night you cannot keep your windows open because the stench is so bad it can be nauseating you get home from work you cannot sit on your back deck could you imagine having to stay in your house with the windows closed that's how bad it is now when I did call um, the town hall uh, last week she did say I talked about this um, possible apartment building and she did say no currently it will not be able to handle the load of 600 five 600 more people and they'll have to make some kind of adjustments but they're not even handling it now so that is my main concern I have a little grandchild I will not walk him down the street because the stench is so bad I'm concerned that it's not healthy to be inhaling this. And no one can tell me for sure that it's okay for a four-month-old baby to be inhaling this. It is that bad. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Maria San Marco, 27 Lucius Court in Milford. Um, I disagree with a couple of the points that were made by Attorney Lynch. Um, one point was that during high commuter hours that only 138 vehicles will be exiting the property of this apartment complex. Well, if you have 342 units and 522 parking spaces, how do you get 138 vehicles exiting? If a lot of apartments have two drivers in them, that's already over 600 cars, closer to 700 cars. Are some people not going to work? They're going to be staying home all day? It's, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Um, he also said that because we protested the first Grillo project, because of the noise and the dust and the trucks going by our road, well, I think we're going to be getting that times 10, maybe even more than that. Um, it, it's a concern, and again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but the sewage pump station, I invite you to come on our property tonight and sit in our clubhouse parking lot. It is particularly bad tonight, and I invite you to come and see what it's like. Um, I would like a guarantee from the City of Milford Sewage Commission that we are not going to have any ill effects and make this situation worse than it already is. Um, I'm not concerned about what the people driving on I-95 see when they pass by this project in Milford. I could care less. What I am concerned about is the degree of deterioration that our neighborhood is going to see as far as the traffic. If you go out our driveway, make a left onto West Avenue and go up to the light where the S-curve is, the light changes and only three or four cars can get through. How is that going to work with this new complex? How can you have a light change and only three cars go through before the light turns red again? So I ask you to please, instead of considering the open space that the new complex is going to give its neighbors with their solar spots and their intimate courtyards and their pool, Think about the residents who are already established in these neighborhoods, not only our condominium, but the single family homes, that these people uh, are going to have to put up with this day in and day out. And the elementary school should be very, very concerned about this with the increase in traffic. And I'm surprised nobody is here representing those people. So I ask you to please think long and hard about this. I think that you, you have good hearts, and it ultimately you'll probably make the right decision, and I hope that you do. So thank you. My name is Frank Ellison. I live in 11 Tibble Street in Milford, Connecticut. But I also have one of the units at Glory Commons with my sister who lives there full time. I, I need to understand something because I, it's true when they said earlier this whole process started over a year ago. It's absolutely true. And I've been at every one of the meetings that they've had concerning this project. And what really, really bothers me is that I know developers and developers have money and they hire attorneys and they hire everyone else that can put this beautiful presentation before you to get their project through. My concern is with the people who have already established residency in Milford, 
who came to Milford for a reason, who choose to live in a particular area in Milford to retire for a reason, who make their lives there, who have their homes there. And all Milford seems to be concerned about is one development after another. The whole idea of Milford and the beauty and what attracts people to it is changing rapidly. And that's due to the fact that every developer who wants something developed gets it developed. And the people who already live there don't matter at all. My strength of that conviction is to tell you, being at every one of these meetings, whether it was the wetlands commissions and the, the uh, exclusionary thing when they had to redo the driveways for the fire department, everybody made excuses. But you know, at every open meeting where the public was asked to contribute, unanimously, going back a year, there's never been one public person who lives in Milford who stood in support of this project. Every single person who came up at every one of these meetings said absolutely not. This is not why we moved to Milford to live near such a congested project. And let me tell you, 342 apartments, dwellings in a single area, that's congestion. Two different buildings, two different. The last meeting I was at, I said, here's my address with my sister at, at Gloria Commons. We look out our window, what are we going to see? A parking garage, a four-story parking garage. You don't move to Milford to a nice scenic area next to a rural area. That's not why you move there. So my question is, if every single person who's come to these meetings and waited for hours every time if every single person, all the boards in Milford have heard from, had said no to this project, then who are you listening to? Do we not have a voice? What is the point of these meetings if you people aren't listening to the people who are established citizens of Milford, who live here, who made their lives here, who chose to move here, to retire here, pay taxes here? Why do we count so little when it comes to developers who just want to develop? Because they're going to come in and they're going to develop, and they're going to go, and they're going to make their money. But the people who have been here all this time are going to still have to live here, but now they're going to have to live there with something they tried to fight from the very beginning that nobody on any board ever listened to. I heard the attorney when he stood up here. He pulled one of the easiest tricks in the book in his conversation with you by presenting you with hypotheticals to make his point sound more strong. He said, oh, well, if we put a huge hotel there, you would get 9,000 or 8,000 or 7,000. If we put a smaller hotel, you'd still get 5,000 traffic. Guess what? With our project, you're only going to get a few thousand. And that sounds great when you compare it to hypotheticals that aren't the facts. The facts are right now, I dare you to go out and try and come out of that complex or go to West Avenue or go to Bick Drive or Schoolhouse Road. Right now, it's hard to get through. He said, oh, another couple th thousand? I consider that a non-issue. Maybe to him it's a non-issue. When you live there and you can't get out of your driveway and it's not safe to go down those streets now, I'm sorry, attorney, a couple more thousand cars added to that is a big issue for the people who live there. And I am vehemently opposed to this project. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to be heard in opposition? My name is Lou Sismadia. I live at 24 Raycroft Street in Milford, which is close to where this uh, development is going to happen. Uh, I can back these people up. We've lived here for 40 years, and that waste plant has been a, a, a sore spot. Every time I drive by there, it's just, it's, it's terrible, and I, I sympathize with the people there. Now, the people that came today paint such a rosy picture. Oh, we built apartment houses in Greenwich, in Stanford, in Darien. I don't want to be a Stanford, Darien, or Greenwich. I want Milford the way it was when I came here 40 years ago. <laughs> one, of, one of the speakers said, we have a native plant, poison ivy. I'd rather walk through poison ivy than see this development 
completed. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joseph Bogdan, B-O-G-D-A-N, and I live at 3 Audubon Close. I've resided there for 26 years, but I've been a lifelong Milford resident. I'm a retired police officer, having served almost 28 years in the Milford Police Department. Many of those years were in the traffic division. The Milford Police Department study, which was mentioned tonight, does raise safety issues in regards to sight line and building access. And from what I read in regards to the building access, they mean officers actually accessing the building, not being able to drive around it. All access from the plans I looked at and from I believe what the police department's looking at is going to have to be through the parking garage. They get a call there. The main lobbies and main entrances are from the parking garages. There's doors around the building, yes. I'm assuming those are going to be locked, fire doors, push bar doors, whatever. So a police officer, a firefighter responding there would have to go through the parking garage into the lobby to gain access to the building. Fire department a lot of times has keys. They have a master lockbox on their truck. When I was on the department, we didn't have any access keys to any of these public projects or any projects that needed or buildings that we needed to get into. We had to wait for a key holder or the fire department to get there. Police department does refer to um, longer response times. And I question the same for even the fire department because if the fire department goes there on a medical, do they have to go into the parking garage with their truck? Would every city fire truck fit into that garage? The garages look to be 10-8. Will the ladder truck fit there? They use the ladder truck for medicals as well as other emergencies when there aren't trucks available. So I do think that's a concern that the board should look at uh, regarding the police department uh, study. Also, too, one thing that wasn't in the police department study that I believe is a safety issue would be sidewalks on West Avenue because you're going to generate school children going to Kennedy School. It's not continuous sidewalks. Uh, as you go up West Ave. And the sidewalks that are there right now, some of it runs on state and city property. They're not maintained, shoveled, plowed, or cleaned. Um, most logical way to walk to school from there, Schoolhouse Road would be busy. School children walking would be using West Avenue. So if sidewalks would be installed, you would probably need a crosswalk in front of Kennedy School, as well as possibly a crossing guard to address that. Um, I'm trying to keep myself short here. I'm sorry, my notes got mixed up. The other uh, major safety concern, at least in my opinion, that has never uh, been, a, been spoken to in this is the Iroquois pipeline. It's a 24-inch main, high pressure, that runs right through the center of the complex. In general, pipelines are safe, but there are accidents. The pipeline was built in 1991. And in 2006, Iroquois paid $22 million in fines, as well as their top four officers were arrested criminally for the construction of that pipeline for environmental and construction violations. Some of the construction violations involved improper backfill along 375 miles of the pipeline, as well as fill with boulders, which aren't supposed to be used in constructing a gas pipeline. Because of that, Iroquois is presently under much stronger federal scrutiny where that pipeline has to be inspected much more frequently, including robot inspections. This is a safety issue. I can't believe a fire marshal in this town would want to put six to 700 people over a pipeline like that. There are a lot of western states, a lot of southern states, and other areas towns and cities have en enacted ordinances restricting building near pipelines. Some restricted to very low density 
residential properties or industrial. Some you can't build within 1,200, 1,500 feet. One place even had three miles. Um, when Iroquois came to Milford, no one wanted it. It was fought, but the federal regulators overruled it. A compromise, this is not the original route that the pipe was proposed either. A compromise was made to bring it through industrial areas and away from high density residential. It skirts some residential along, um, you know, Bick Drive, some of the ones on the other side, and also Meadowside Road, but they're all single family houses. And if you look at the federal data that's available, it's not recommended to put high density developments over a pipeline. So I hope the board would at least look at data and investigate that aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak in opposition to the application? Good late evening to everybody. My name is Irene Ellison, and I live at 8 Lucius Court. The main, I was going to uh, talk about several things, but the main thing that seems to summarize everything that I was thinking about was something that Attorney Lynch mentioned, that this is a huge project in a small area. That says it in a nutshell, because you, you're gonna, you, you do have a small area. And this is a huge project with many people, many cars, a lot of traffic, a lot of congestion, a lot of exhaust. It's against safety and it's against health. So yes, I totally, I do not approve of this project. It makes no sense. And if you're a common sense person, if you're putting a huge project in a small area, that makes no sense. Thank you. I feel a little awkward coming up here. <clears throat> My name is Cliff Mason, 1427 Naugatuck Avenue, Milford. <clears throat> um, just to give you a little background. I'm retired. I was industrial engineering. I was marketing. I was project development for Sylvan Development uh, Limited. I did work on this project in 1986. At that time, it was excess uh, property belonging to the uh, New Haven Water Company. The uh, property manager at that time was Otto Schaefer. Otto Schaefer came to the developers offering this 57 acres uh, with rights for commercial development. It, uh, at that time, didn't have a pipeline. It didn't uh, have uh, inland wetland restrictions that it presently does. It, it did enable to build over uh, usable site, uh, portions of this site, two 60,000 square foot buildings on the uh, southeast portion, uh, two buildings of approximate the same size on the uh, west southwest portion, and one building of about 80,000 square feet on the north portion of the property. Uh, we took it on as a look see project. Uh, we did invest uh, in geodetic work, we invested in uh, survey, surveying work, environmental work. Uh, we ran up a tab of almost $300,000. Um, our present proposed developer here 
has spent four years on this project. Uh, he's probably spent twice as much money as we spent. As a matter of fact, uh, we thought we had a deal with the water company. Uh, the water company advised us, first they have to officially offer it to the community. It's the, the law. Politics became involved. Uh, community made uh, design changes. Uh, they made additional requirements. Uh, we had to uh, comply with additional uh, fire services, additional uh, firehouses, uh, equipment. Uh, gotten, the state uh, got involved. The state uh, said, well, you're dealing with the uh, state road. Uh, you're going to have to have a deceleration lane. You're going to have to have an acceleration lane. You're going to have to have um, coordinated lighting with all the other lighting systems on the uh, post road. These additional costs, we felt we could still meet the necessary performer requirements as a project. Uh, the city decided to take uh, possession of the property. Uh, uh, negotiations with the city said that uh, that property is gonna be uh, twice the price. At that point, we dropped out. At that point, the economy became uh, an issue uh, we had uh, several developments uh, in East Fishkill, New York, uh, in New London, uh, Science Park in New Haven. Uh, we were doing about $50 million worth of corporate building in Sikorsky, Blue Cross, the Hartford, uh, uh, and others. The net effect was eight banks foreclosed on them. We were out of business. Uh, we finally, the banks took over, I think, uh, 1989. I was long gone. I was working for other construction firms. Um, I hadn't walked this property in quite some time. We <coughs> started looking at it again when the gentleman, the gentleman here uh, the Gorilla Brothers uh, wanted to do a manufacturing operation on that location. Uh, being somewhat familiar with the property, I said, well, hey, wait a minute, that's light office residential. Uh, theirs was a rather naughty manufacturing with a lot of effects. We opposed it. Uh, they lost, but they still retained development rights to the property. Uh, when we spoke against this project, what, about a year ago, I guess, uh, I made a series of suggestions as to what the usable land could be. I suggested uh, perhaps put up a building for the subway since they were still in, in the expansion state. I suggested perhaps a, a, another hotel, like Motel 6, uh, perhaps a medical office building, perhaps uh, senior uh, housing or senior assistance. Uh, I hoped they would not go to G8 or, or uh, 830G. Well, with their investment, they decided they would try to recover their, their uh, investment, and they went to 8.30, gee. So here we are. <laughs> I hope, I hope they, they acknowledge what I'm saying is essentially true. I can understand their plight. Uh, they've got significant uh, uh, wealth and treasure into this property and I understand where they're coming from and I suggested them that they lick their wounds and move on and, and develop uh, their 
uh, manufacturing operation up in the valley where there are sites available to do that work and where their market is, covers Fairfield County as well. Uh, now we have a situation where despite all the reasons and complaints that we can make up here, we are outgunned. Uh, 830G prevails no matter what we do or say. I can only point to the future situation that the Gorilla Brothers are probably going to encounter. There's an old axiom in the uh, in, uh, development business that says uh, <coughs> the first developer goes in there and he gets his permits and, and he, he, he gets to the point where he just can't go further and he drops out. The second developer comes along and he gets the rest of the permits, but he, he drops out, he can't go further. The third developer comes in, he takes all of the lessons learned and he takes all of the plans that the previous developers came up to and he puts the finances together and the project gets built. I think now the Grillo, Grillo Brothers now have the authority to build 432 units with 522 parking places at a density of four, 42 units per square acre, uh, which is twice anything that's allowable under uh, Income Assistance, uh, uh, Section 828, or whatever. <laughs> okay. Thank I'm you, getting, Mr. Mason. I'm getting there. Um, if you would not mind, if you just could wrap up very briefly, or after others have had the opportunity to speak, you're welcome to address us again. Okay. Return later. Thank you very much, sir. Is there anyone else that wishes to be heard in opposition to the application? Good evening, sir. Yes. Uh, my name is Mark Kligger, uh, 33 Audubon Close. You position the microphone in front, in front of you oh, would be okay. great. Thank you. Mark Kligger, 33 Audubon Close. Uh, the first handout on the bottom of the uh, cover sheet says uh, traffic issues. Uh, and that's the one I'd like to refer to uh, first of all. Uh, there's been talk uh, this evening about the sight line uh, to the left when one exits the proposed driveway onto uh, West Avenue. Uh, photos one through four were taken uh, uh, from the driveway, uh, slightly closer to the driveway and slightly behind the driveway. Um, as you can see, uh, it's, it's not a matter of foliage, um, that, that there's a real uh, visibility problem to that left sight line. Uh, that, which is caused by the bridge over, uh, overpass, the I-95 overpass, as well as the curvature of the road. 
Um, I've tried to capture that uh, in the four photographs uh, with the hope that uh, the, the pictures would speak uh, uh, a thousand words. Um, photos five and six in that handout uh, are uh, show uh, approaching the property from the Kennedy School. Uh, once you go through the overpass, the property, the subject property and driveway are going to be on the right. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's difficulty as you approach that overpass, uh, even seeing the property, let alone the driveway. Um, I took that uh, uh, from the opposite side of the street. Uh, cars approaching would be in that right lane uh, as they approach the uh, overpass, and the property would be on the right after the overpass. And, and I've tried to capture and demonstrate for you again the difficulty of vehicles approaching the property from uh, the school, uh, seeing the driveway and seeing cars coming out of it. So I think there is a real problem uh, uh, with that sight line. Uh, another thing that hasn't been raised uh, is the uh, Grinnell Street in between Naugatuck Avenue and West Avenue. Um, I put a little map in there. Um, it's a road that uh, in recent years has uh, been used more and more, uh, particularly when Gloria Commons and, and uh, uh, Beaverbrook and, and, and some additional housing came up in the area. I guess more and more people are using it. Uh, maybe more and more people working at Subway are using it. Uh, but the point I want to make uh, uh, with respect to that uh, aspect of Grinnell Street um, is that it is probably the uh, shortest and easiest way uh, for somebody at 553 West Avenue uh, to access the 36 on-ramp uh, to New Haven northbound. And uh, uh, picture seven and eight uh, demonstrate uh, the view coming from West Avenue heading toward Naugatuck Avenue on Grinnell Street. Uh, in picture eight, uh, you have open space on your right. Uh, you can't see it, but the uh, Kingdom Life parking lot abuts that on the right side. On the left side, uh, which you can't see as well, are uh, the rear of some of the units of Audubon Manor. Uh, in photo number seven, um, you're looking at the same thing. Your uh, Audubon Manor is going to be on your left. Uh, you can see a curve there. Uh, in photos uh, 9 and 10, opposite direction, somebody uh, heading toward West Avenue uh, from Naugatuck Avenue. Again, you see the curves in the road, a narrow road, and uh, already traffic has gotten heavier over the years, uh, and cars tend to uh, uh, travel at a, a quick clip. Uh, I have a concern about the effect of traffic on that road. Um, also, I'm wondering if the uh, uh, traffic study that's been done has taken, with respect to uh, a big drive and subway and schoolhouse, I'm wondering if that has taken into consideration uh, the, the fact that the Garden Homes Project uh, on Big Drive, right at that uh, corner near Naugatuck Avenue, has been approved uh, and, and, and in all likelihood is going to be built. Uh, I don't know if the traffic study has taken that into account. I know the, uh, the police traffic report that I saw uh, expressed concern about congestion uh, on Schoolhouse and in that area. Um, I guess what I'm, I'm going to do at that point in light of the traffic concerns that have been raised and the ones that I've attempted to raise, and at least uh, uh, through use of photographs, is um, I know that there is a, a municipal ordinance, I believe it is 18-90.2 subsection B, uh, that uh, uh, empowers uh, uh, the board uh, uh, to uh, ask uh, or use or invoke the help of um, an independent consultant, uh, particularly in the area of traffic, and, and, and particularly given that a number of traffic considerations have been, concerns have been raised here this evening, 
um, I'm going to respectfully request um, uh, that the board uh, does appoint a, uh, an independent consultant, exercise its authority to do so, uh, uh, to look at some of these traffic problems. Uh, uh, particularly when you're dealing with traffic, um, uh, there may be variances in the way da data is gathered and uh, in the way data is interpreted. Uh, and in light of that, I think it's, it's critically important uh, uh, that we have a, 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 some independent consultant evaluating some of the traffic problems. Now, the other issue I wanted to raise goes more to 830G itself. Um, the affordable, the statute defines affordable housing application as quote unquote, any application made to a commission in connection with an affordable housing development by a person who proposes to develop such affordable housing. Now our, our, our state Supreme Court has, uh, has said uh, uh, that um, a person seeking to pursue this application has to uh, provide some meaningful assurance that he will build the affordable housing. Our lower courts uh, have also uh, uh, stated uh, 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 very similar, uh, uh, that uh, the person who applies uh, uh, to build affordable housing has to, in a serious way, propose uh, uh, to build this housing. Uh, uh, now, what I'm getting at here is uh, in that booklet you will uh, see two things. One is a, um, a May 2nd Conservation Commission uh, report uh, uh, based on a walkthrough through the property. Uh, and uh, in that report is it, it is indicated uh, that the applicant uh, acting through its managing uh, members has stated that it does not intend to build this affordable housing but we'll rather uh, look around uh, uh, for a developer to do that. Um, also, Connecticut Post article, uh, which I provided to you Sunday, May 21st, 2017, uh, uh, where again, the applicants uh, managing members uh, come out and say, uh, we're not gonna be building this thing uh, uh, we've got a few developers that are interested, uh, uh, we'll sell them the land. Um, it seems to me, as a technical matter, and it's not hyper-technical, this is, uh, according to the Supreme Court, important, uh, that we've got an application here that's questionably not an affordable housing application because it hasn't been filed and it's not being advanced uh, uh, by someone who proposes uh, uh, to build the affordable housing. Uh, in, in, in fact, um, coming out of the starting gate, uh, the applicant has indicated that it does not propose to build the affordable housing. Uh, and, and I think when, you know, it's something that on appeal could be cured if somebody comes uh, uh, to the superior court on an administrative appeal and says, yes, I'm going to build the housing. Uh, maybe at that point it gets cured. But at this point, I have a lot of questions. Who's going to build this thing? Um, why isn't that party uh, uh, somebody who is on this application and pursuing the application? Uh, there are a lot of abuses that can take place. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, some uh, people can uh, speculate, try to get put together a package and then try and sell it to a developer. Uh, if they can't sell it or don't sell it, then the objectives of the affordable housing statute are not met. Uh, uh, secondly, there's a problem uh, sort of like what we had at 990 Naugatuck Avenue with Recycling Inc., where you've got somebody applying uh, to do this project and then there's somebody in the background uh, who hasn't come out and the, and the one in the background uh, uh, may have uh, uh, problems in the past with environmental compliance or with uh, uh, playing by the rules in general. Somebody lurking in the background who gets to take over a finished project. 
Uh, Thank you, Mr. Klinger. Um, uh, at this point, if I could ask you that um, if you want to continue your remarks, that you come back after everyone has had the opportunity uh, to be heard. Thank you very much. Um, but we are approaching 11 o'clock under our bylaws. 11 o'clock is the time that we um, stop our meeting unless a motion is made to, uh, to continue. But at this point, it is 10.55. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to uh, be heard in opposition to the project? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Gail Slosberg. I live at 14 Honeysuckle Lane. I am the state senator for this district. And in, in consideration of the late hour, I'm going to be very brief. I thought the residents did a really great job in terms of presenting their concerns. Um, just very briefly, often when we talk about 830G, we talk about health and safety. And I just want to make sure that the public, and I know the board, um, board certainly knows that, the standard is that you may consider health, and you may deny on the basis of health and safety and any other matters properly before the commission. So I know we always talk about health and safety, but I just want to remind probably more the members of the public that there is a catch-all, and it's not just health and safety. Generally, when there are issues, they are more um, prevalent when they're health and safety, but there is a catch-all. Here, you know, when I'm listening to this, and, and I, I, in all honesty, have not had an, a great opportunity to review the application, it stands out to me that uh, in the first instance, our police department has denied this application. Uh, I think that's very important and something very significant. And while the applicants say they'd like to go back and, you know, try something else with them and see what happens, um, the application before you and the application that the public is speaking on has been denied um, by the police commission. I have serious concerns when they start talking about this being in a floodplain um, and that they need FEMA approval. It seems to me to be very strange that they're here and yet they still have to go to FEMA. Um, they talked about filling in and compensating elsewhere with regard to, you know, filling in the floodplain, but they're going to compensate elsewhere. I didn't hear anything about where that elsewhere is. Um, that impact could be very significant. It will, you know, the impact is that everyone upstream gets flooded. Uh, I think we need to know those things. In addition, they talked about uh, having to go um, to OSTA, uh, you know, through the DOT, and the DOT is studying this interchange right now, and they still have to get permits from DOT, and I can tell you, because I hear it every day of the week, DOT approvals are very slow in coming, um, and if they're studying this right now, again, big question about whether this application is premature, whether it's really ripe to be for you, as well as deep. Um, you know, one of the biggest complaints I get about DEEP is it takes 18 months for an approval. So my question is sort of why are we here at this time? Um, in addition to that, I know that we got that there was sewer approval and the fire marshal initially uh, rejected, but then I'm inferring that the fire marshal came back and then approved. I, I don't know whether that's actually true or not. But I would suggest, based on the members of the public, I think two really important issues were raised. One, what's going on with the sewer and the pump station there that they're smelling gas, that they're smelling things in their, you know, in their yard uh, that seems inappropriate? And, and I think that's something that I know this board will go back and, and, and look into, as well as the point raised about the Iroquois um, gas pipeline. Uh, I can't imagine that there aren't safety challenges with trying to build a very massive and dense structure around a gas pipeline. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that that's something that you could just, you know, uh, sort of look the other way to um, when you're talking about building a four-story building. So, I, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about those are the grounds for potential denial and the standards there, but as you know also, uh, there is the potential, although I don't recommend it, but that you would approve, approve, but you can approve with conditions. And this is an area that we fight out, fight about an awful lot in general when we talk about 830G, because I've heard it in this room many times where people have said, we have no, we can't do anything at all because it's 830G. Well, you can place conditions. So you can place conditions on what is being built here, being proposed here. 
And, and some of those things should be addressing your sound planning principles. A30G doesn't wipe those all away. You still have those. So one of those sound planning principles is, you know, what else is in the neighborhood? You're talking about a massive, you know, two huge barrack style buildings that are four stories. I'm trying to think if there's anything else around there that, you know, is, is reasonably four stories, certainly not residential. You know, so when we're talking about building affordable housing, the idea about affordable housing was to have it, you know, mixed use. So you have, um, you know, you have your market rate units and you have your affordable units. But there isn't anybody in this town who's ever going to drive by and not know that's the affordable housing development because it sticks out like a sore thumb in relationship to everything else. These buildings may be beautiful in Stamford. They may be beautiful in a downtown area, but they really, are, they, they really don't look like anything else that's nearby in that area. And when you're talking about best design in affordable housing, you know, it makes a lot more sense to have something that looks more like duplexes, where people have a front door and a back door and a yard and some place to, you know, to sit outside that's a little bit more um, in keeping with what is around the rest of the neighborhood. We had an 830G hearing in the legislature um, in, the, in the spring, and one of the, um, actually one of the developers who's been before you, uh, we had a colloquy. And I said, you know, how come you think it's okay that you can come in and build something, you know, a four-story building where everything else is a single-family home, everything else is, you know, low-rise? And how come that's okay? And he said, it's not okay. It's not okay. That's not part of sound planning principles. And I remember him very clearly telling me, you know, you wouldn't say to a, a, a sound planner that you can take a field and then just build an, an eight-story building in it, and somehow that fits in. That's not sound planning principles. But what I just want to remind the public, and because I know you know this already, if you were after, I'm sure, much more investigation to decide that you were going to approve this, and again, I don't recommend that, you do have some, you ha do have some authority in your back pocket to make sure that the right development would be proposed. And you don't have any obligation to agree to 342 units just because that's what the developer needs to make their profit. You are allowed. You are allowed to make those choices as to what's right for the citizens of Milford. I have every faith and confidence that you will do that. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for your service. It is now 11.03. I promise. And uh, I'm sorry, I, Mr. Mason, it's 11.03. We're going to continue the can hearing. Can I summarize in, at this in point. one sentence? I'm sorry, not at this time, <laughs> sir. Uh, is there a motion Cut it in to half extend the time? And it will get built. It will get built. <laughs> is there a motion to extend the time of the meeting? Seeing none, it appears that uh, we will conclude the meeting for this evening. Uh, we will suspend uh, this, uh, this uh, public hearing during the uh, initial public comment portion. And uh, my apologies to Mr. Mason and Mr. Kligger for not being able to um, uh, speak to us again. But uh, at our next meeting, when this will appear on the agenda again, I'm sure, uh, please uh, return and uh, please let us know the remainder of your thoughts uh, in addition to anyone else that would like to speak again. Um, Mr. Salkis, is there anything else I have to do with regard to the rest of the agenda? If we, if we suspend now at 11 o'clock? Uh, you should quickly go through the rest of the agenda, I, I think. Um, they're going to be very quick items. Um, okay. Is Mr. Marlowe still in the building? Paging Mr. Marlowe. Ahead. There he is.
Okay, we did, uh, we just finished that. Any uh, liaison reports? Okay, regulation subcommittee. Is Nothing Grant. at this time. Uh, I'd entertain a motion for approval of the minutes for the August 1st meeting. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, passes. Uh, chair report, because of the hour, I'll save a report for next time. Uh, staff report? Uh, none this evening. And a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. There you go. Very good. Opposed? None.